with uh, a different plan uh, going forward. So uh, those are the, the issues where the things are blocked. So the, the town board had expressed the desire to uh, maintain the landscape median on Marshall. I and mean, then we've gone through the process of designing the DDI so we know its footprint, you know, where the curb and gutter is going to end up on the Caslin. Um, we have, have looked at their modeling, and we do need three lanes northbound on, on McCaslin, and having that triple left is important to the long-range operation of, of the DDI and to Marshall McCaslin. Um, the other thing that's come up through the DDI design is that uh, there's a desire to put bike lanes on McCaslin. Right now, there's bike lanes on, on the Caslin south of Marshall. There's bike lanes on the Caslin north of, of US 36. There's no bike lanes between Marshall and the north side of the bridge. <coughs> so the DDI is going, going to, to have bike lanes over the bridge. And so one consideration is... Could you uh, use your pointer and tell me where there are no bike lanes? Mm -hmm. I'm directionally challenged. Yes. So there's bike lanes from, this is Marshall McCaslin, and this, there's bike lanes south of Marshall going all the way down to Rock Creek Parkway on both sides mm -hmm. of, of McCaslin here. There's no bike lanes from this point going north, and there's no bike lanes over the bridge. Once you get on the north side of the bridge, there are bike lanes on, on McCaslin going into Lewisville and all the way up Lewisville. So this is the missing link for bike lanes. So we wanted to say, if we're going to do anything with Marshall McCaslin, maybe we should coordinate with the DDI design. Wow. Okay, so... So here's a concept we came up with. Um, to provide that, that third lane without touching the median, what if we provide a slip lane on the Conoco um, corner, provide a slip lane for the right turn lane. And then we take, uh, there's the two existing left turn lanes. This is a through lane now, and we convert that to the third left turn lane. And <coughs> the right turn lane that's out there now would become the through lane. And then we'd have a little slip lane, and you've seen these slip lanes around the area, you just slip into this this lane and make your right turn from that uh, little slip lane. So there's a couple issues with that is we don't quite line up with the other side of uh, uh, Marshall, but it's not, this is not uncommon, it's an offset. We probably want to correct that in the long term, but we can do this in the short term and still I think you, the, the rule of thumb is not to have more than a six-foot offset in the lane as you're going across the intersection. So we can maintain that. This movement is fairly light as well. We can get the slip lane in. We can provide this island. And one of the challenges with designing this <coughs> island is that there's a traffic single pole and there's a traffic controller right in this corner. And the size of the island, we've made this pretty big in this scenario because we wanted to preserve the traffic pole and the controller, not have to move them. And that's that's an issue that you can make it a smaller one and have less impacts on the conical access, but then you'd have to replace the pole and so forth. All right, let's point out, let's go up to the bike lanes. Here's where we would add, we would take the, and it's hard to see here, but we would take the curb and gutter and, and sidewalk there and move it out. And in doing that, there's a traffic pole that we'd have to relocate. So relocating the traffic light is really, in this case, due to the fact that we, we need to provide a bike lane. To provide the bike lane, we need to, to move the curb and gutter out, and then we need to move the, the traffic light. And I think one of the comments from CDOT in this whole triple, triple left discussion was they were afraid about cars hitting that light pole, and we, they really recommended that we relocate it anyway. So that's, that's a, a cost there, and then putting the curb and gutter in. 
So also in coordinating with the DDI, they're going to do um, meeting and improvements here, you know, because they're flaring out and so forth. So they're going to they're going to touch the median that's out there now from about this point. If they're going to do that, we might as well implement this and set this up for a double left turn lane. With the town center, eventually we're going to need a, a double left turn lane in the southbound direction, southbound, coming across the bridge, <coughs> turning into Marshall, because we have all the town center here. So eventually we need a double left turn lane. Let's set this up when the DDI is being built and do our our portion of the improvements and get it get it done. Where's the uh, where does the uh, DDI roughly start? At least they're roughly start preparing to cross about, over about here. Okay. And so those arrows that you have, the blue and the green, that's where the uh, brakes plus is. Brakes plus is up. Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry. Okay. Thanks. This is kind of that corner, bacon parcel. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So if you do that uh, double left, do you just have you still have two through lanes. Okay, then, right now we have three southbound through lanes. Okay. And we so have, if you do a double line. We have three. Right now we've striped this for three lanes. Right. But we wanted to make this improvement and this improvement to set this up for a double a left. And But how many uh, through lanes would you continue to have or have at that point? We would have three in each direction and we'd have two left turn lanes. We'd have three southbound, three northbound and two southbound left turn lanes. Through lanes, or three total lanes? Yeah, five. You have three through lanes and two left turn lanes. Okay. Yeah. There a total of eight lanes, three through in each direction and two left turn lanes. Yeah. And that's without widening it? It's just taking out the median? Yeah, the median, the median is the median? about eight feet or so. Oh, okay. So it's going to go down to four feet. So okay. we're picking up you know, four or six feet from the median, and then we're moving the, the curb and gutter hole. Okay. Is this going to, um, I mean, how confusing is this intersection going to be at that point? I mean, <laughs> it's getting there. You I mean, think. how complicated uh, is it going to be to drive? Uh, oh, my goodness. It's like the Arc de Triomphe. There's a triple, uh, there's a triple up at uh, Foothills and, or is it a wrap up? Wrap up. If you've been through that intersection, it's, I mean, it doesn't seem too confusing if, when you go through that one. Um, so I think the way this, we're talking about setting this intersection up, it'll be. Right. But in this case, I mean, this is a pretty common uh, thing. You have three through lanes and a double left turn lane. I mean, that's a pretty common, uh, a lot of the uh, arterials are set up that way. We keep talking about residential feel. Mm -hmm. You know, and that whole mm -hmm. McCaslin stretch. Mm -hmm. I'm quite familiar with that one now that, that I'm visualizing. That's concrete jungle there. I mean, it's at Foothills in Arapaho. Are we going to have concrete yeah. jungle here? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there going to be anything um, small community looking about this, or is this going to be concrete it, jungle? It can't be. It isn't. I mean, the, the opportunities to soften that will be on the east side um, uh, with the town center development mm -hmm. and then that little piece of property. Right you know, there. We'll, we'll have some islands, you know, the, you know, we have an island here, we'll duplicate it here, and we'll have an island here. We don't, we don't want to take any more room from, from that. That's a pretty small parcel, but we'll have some islands. But it's not, it's not very pedestrian friendly if you're yeah. talking about I mean this is the well, intersection in town and remember some of us uh, the reason one of the reasons you're here today and we didn't resolve this months ago was because some of us wanted to retain that bank of trees there on that median yeah. and the reason we wanted to maintain that bank of trees is to give it a cozy sure. green feel and not concrete Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to make sure we're not here. robbing Peter to pay Paul we'll here. We'll still have that here, and we'll have the opportunity uh, here. That'll still be a landscape median. There are here, there's two rows of trees. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's two rows of trees, and, and we're kind of at the end of that row, so we take a few trees, but there's, there's a whole row that we're not touching. So there are, I mean, it, this used to be maple, maple? 
yeah. street. Uh, yeah. So this is pretty wide through here, <laughs> and you and you have that landscape. And how? Where is the proper property? Uh, the building lines of Conoco, the actual structure at Conoco. It looks to me like that's almost going to be on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have an aerial that will show that. Okay. okay. So this is another, just another concept, be able to, to get the triple left in without impacting this landscaping. It impacts some of this landscaping, but, um, you know, we've got another <coughs> island here, and it's, it's a way to accomplish that without, you know, getting over the, the getting into the landscape meeting that, that we had original design. But when the town center comes in, uh, on the east side of the street, that will be landscaped right. in a more pedestrian friendly, okay. even more so than yeah, the west side. It's going to have your entrance. You know, it's kind of like what uh, the marketplace has at, at the mm -hmm. north mm -hmm. west corner there. It'll be something similar to that. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to show you the, the, the ultimate improvements, because these are this is kind of interim to get the triple left in. Can I have uh, one more question? Yeah. Sorry, it's a real quick one. Where do pedestrians go? It, is there an underpass right here? Well, you somewhere? Know, I would like we'll actually to eliminate pedestrians here because if they're crossing the triple left, I'd like to maintain pedestrians here. Okay. And and get them out, you know, maybe take that crosswalk out, but that's that's down the road. But we would you know, this is this could be a raised slip lane, you know, where we have, you know, you have to go up and over if you if you think about that, and that's something to think about. We don't really have one in town, but mm -hmm. they're around Bowler or Lewisville's putting in. So we could do that there. We could do that here, ultimately, and here as well. Um, so pedestrians, to me, are in, on those three, I'd like to try to eliminate. But in, in the long run, are we incorporating that into the town center? I mean, a lot of people who live on that side are going to want to go to the town center or vice mm -hmm. versa, uh, depending on what they're doing shopping-wise. Right. And we also are, uh, we would like them to use the McCaslin underpass if that's built. We okay. have that, and we have the Coal Creek underpass. We have two other ways nice for, connections. for those, for the residents on either side to get to the shopping and so forth, by not even have to cross at that grade. The car cross. traffic from... Sagamore and original town, though. Underpass isn't going to be cars, right? No. No, that's okay. Walk. But when, when we, um, just for those residents mm -hmm. who want to get to the town center, they're going to be coming, a lot of them will be coming down Marshall. Mm -hmm. They'll have the one lane. Well, if they want to go to the town center from Sagamore, they could, Cole Creek. they could come through Coal Creek where we've done traffic coming, mm -hmm. and they can go through that's down true. McCaslin to the Coal Creek. Uh, right. bridge right. and go under there to get to the town center. That would be a way to get over there without at least that portion that's south of the and then creek. You know, as part of the town center project, we've discussed several times uh, an additional underpass on the south side, kind of where the railroad bed is. That so might be a potential connection. Right, we else. talked about that earlier today. But that would not be a car connection, or would it be a car no. connection? No, I mean, it would start out as pedestrian, but it could be, I mean, I, I think we would at least look at possibly making it big enough to make it Here, a car at some point. If here's, where, to. here's where I'm going. I just uh, was up in Boulder today, and when I came down, I, uh, of course, took that far right lane off 36 heading south. Uh, right? Where? Uh, coming, coming back, com to coming back from Boulder. Oh, okay. Okay? South on McCaslin. So I, I take the far right one, which is my habit. Mm -hmm. I should take that other one over, but you got to stop the light there. Anyway, I take the far right one and do a uh, take that, and of course I got that crossover traffic coming right at me to go to Superior Marketplace. So you're jostling there, and I imagined this little slip ramp, if it were in place. And then you're going to have jostling of that traffic heading south from the slip ramp as well. So I'm coming, and there's a lot of that traffic that comes south uh, from Boulder, south on McCaslin coming from Boulder to Superior. And it was a very quick jostle, jostle. Yes. It's very quick. 
And that made me very concerned about the advisability of this slip ramp. Well, this is a little bit different because up, up at um, the ramp, uh, the through traffic southbound has, what, 70, 80 seconds of green time. So that through traffic's coming all the time. They only get stopped for the 15, 20 seconds when the ramp stops it and goes. So you have this continuous flow, and you have the continuous flow of the right turners. So those two are continuous flowing. They're jostling all the time. Here, this right turn is uh, the southbound traffic is going to have to be stopped because of the, of the heavy movement here. We're going to have this. It's not going to be a continuous flow as it is up at the ramp because you only have you have to provide some time to the. But at those the, points, when when the, sometimes the lights will allow me to do both at once. They're mm -hmm. not going to always be perfectly timed, right? To where if I'm coming, if I'm doing just what I did today, mm -hmm. where I had to jostle right at coming south there at off of 36. Mm -hmm. And then with this imaginary slip ramp there, jostle again, it's not going to be eliminated, but you're telling me it won't be as frequent. Right. At, right? Uh, yeah, up at the DDI, right. it changes completely up there because now you'll have. You're stopped. You're going to be stopped. There won't be a free right anyway. Right. Oh, I see. Yeah, so we're eliminating that, that thing. Yes. Yeah. I, I think this will part not be quite as bad. Because when you come off of 36, the jostle you're talking about there, you not only are getting off, you're kind of wanting to get over to the left. Here, you don't have to get over to the left until quite a ways up for Caslin. So you can maintain the right lane a longer time because we don't have that right turn only lane coming into into Town Hall and, or into Coal Creek anymore. So. I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't think the jostle would be quite as bad from this slip lane because I don't think a lot of the traffic coming from north to south is over in the far right lane trying to go up McCaslin. They're more in the center and, and uh, left trying to get over to hopefully town center. So what's happening at Coal Creek? Well, it's straight up until you get past the bridge. And so you don't have to get over to, you don't go down from three lanes to two lanes for a fair amount of time. <coughs> so you have time to merge over. Whereas if you come off of 36 and onto McCaslin right now, you got to do something quickly and you're, you're doing the weave. And, uh, you know, we all should be doing the using the stoplight, but who wants to do that when you can take a risk? <laughs> you can get killed. Yeah. Uh, so, I, but I hear what you're saying. I, 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 I certainly want to preserve the ability to uh, go south without getting caught in the backup on on uh, Marshall, though, too, because that just spreads the pain for further. But don't you sort of still get caught on it? What happens? Well, if the slippery lane doesn't go far enough back, yeah, yeah you won't get caught. Until How many car lengths is that there? I think we can hear. Uh, yeah. Going back, going back we, to we yeah. car lane, like two. How many cars are in that right straight lane? Here? That if they come back to the end of right. the slip lane, how this many cars is, probably, is that? There's probably three and... You know, I think we've, we've looked at it, Chris and me. And yeah, there's a long-term plan to show. Yeah, and this isn't this is an ideal, and we'll show you what we want to do in mm -hmm. the long term, because that that is an issue. So uh, it will be when the town center comes through. It yeah, because right it'll be more used than it is now. And getting to the mayor's desire to make this pedestrian friendly, you know, is that that's was some of the genesis for this. Uh, McCaslin underpass, you know, that would be perfect if we could go a diagonal, diagonal across the, mm -hmm. but apparently that was not engineerly feasible. feasible no. So, I just want to show you this about how it, it fits on an aerial and where the, this is kind of the old, the, over the, the pumps and the, the buildings back here, here's the car wash. The actual right-of-way 
can hardly see it. This is the red line. This is the right of way for Maple, the old Maple, and here's the right of way for McCaslin. So we're we're pretty close at, at this point with with that particular design, but you know we'll we'll be working on that. And so you come back and here's the trees, and so you, you're taking out one or two of uh, of these trees coming back. And uh, traffic single pole. I think is in there. Just want to touch on um, the the ultimate. What do we want to do in terms of the ultimate? So we plan for that. Anything we do kind of would hopefully fit into that. Um, we want to provide six lanes on McCaslin through Marshall, so three lanes in each direction, north and south. The eastbound triple left on Marshall. Uh, we'll need double left turn lanes on all approaches. Um, we only have it on the eastbound approach now. And then bike lanes on McCaslin. So that's kind of what we've been looking at the, the long term. Um, on the eastbound, we want to relocate the, the curb and gutter, and I'll show you what, what's going to happen here, and I'll show you why we need to uh, replace single poles, and then if we're going to do some construction, we probably want, you know, we're going to have a new DDI interchange, we probably want to overlay the whole intersection and make it look, you know, bring it up to stuff. Right now, there's the pavement's starting to deteriorate. The, uh, the slip lane, you remember, you, you came in right in here, in the long term, we'd like to take that lane farther back and, in fact, go all the way back through second, maybe third, with the white. I'm sorry, what's the, what's the top there? Th this is just Marshall over here. This is Marshall. If you take this and take line it, it up Take it all over the here. way back to okay. second right. and third. Wow. And Wait, what? So what just, whoa, whoa, back up. Uh, one of the concerns I have with this design is that you have a left. You have a through lane coming in, and now, if you stay in that through lane, it becomes a left turn lane. So people that want to go through have to shift. You know, which is kind of un, you know, it's it's not uncommon, but it's you know, you want to provide a better transition transition for the through, through traffic that wants to go through the intersection. That they now they have to shift down to the lane to go through. So this makes that transition. A little better by taking it, it farther back, so you, you're giving a lot more time for, for that transition to occur. And it's the through through lane, so you're you're back here. You shift you shift way back here, and we can do that through striping and make it more seamless than you can with just providing the slip lane and without bringing that all the way back. So that's an ultimate uh, wish list, I guess. The other thing with the the double left turn lanes, we have single poles that are only so long, and so they don't extend all the way to the point the way you really need it for the double left turn lane. So, and this, the ultimate will have to replace this pole, uh, a pole here. We've already relocated that pole, and to get this left turn lane, we'd have to relocate that pole. We're not saying we need to do that all right away. But eventually, if we have left turn lanes on all of them, we may have to replace all, all the single poles. The other thing that's happening here, in order to get, again, better capacity to provide, we don't have a, a, a third northbound through lane on the cast. It's two here, and then it becomes three. So this provides a third through lane. And by doing that, we, we got to move out to the east on the south of Marshall provide another pork chop, and that results in moving a pole as well. The final thing is that to provide a double left turn lane here, we have to do um, some widening on this side and provide, move that landscape island. But this also winds up uh, having the through lanes line up. Okay, so now we don't have the offset. This through lane lines up with that through lane. So it's kind of all the ultimate stuff. Here's what you want to do in long-range condition. A lot of these things would only be done if the town center develops and we we have a lot of traffic coming from that side, then we make some of these improvements. Okay. So um, when CDOT looked at was it this, these particular plans that CDOT looked at, or no. were they something different? It was a different plan. It was the triple lane, the triple left with the left turn in the median. Okay. 
And they had an issue then, right? Because we were not planning on relocating that pole. We, okay, it was all about that pole? The pole there. Okay. Yeah, we were, we were resisting that to try to save costs. And now we're saying, well, the bike lanes are going to make us relocate the pole, so let's bite the bullet. Oh, okay. And on the back of the napkin type of scale, what's the delta between the temporary and the ultimate? Yeah. Well, that's the next slide. Okay. <laughs> well, trying to help out. I can anticipate. <laughs> okay. So what I've done is, is provide some common elements and building on the triple lift. Um, this was the original option where we added the lane and the median. And if you recall, this was the cost we were going to do of just adding that left turn and median, not relocating the pole, just getting that, that triple left in. So you had, that's the cost you had seen before. Uh, now we need to, uh, if we're going to look at improvements to coordinate with the DDI, uh, including the curb relocation to get the bike lane um, and a median modification uh, to provide the southbound double left turn lane. So that's about $70,000 for the, the improvements on McCaslin north of Marshall. Relocating the pole in the northeast corner, that's about 75000 and then here, the right turn slip lane is a little bit less costly than adding it in the median. So that's about 110000 So this is these costs of what we would do if you want to just get that in, kind of the minimum cost to coordinate with the DDI to get the bike lane in, get the triple let lane in. So this is kind of the interim one if you want to move, move forward with that. And that's it's doable. We, we could do it, you know, fairly quickly. We have, what, I think a hundred. Fifty thousand budget, so we'd have to find another hundred thousand to to move forward with with that particular one. Um, the this option looks at well, we have a new DDI. We've torn up now the intersection in several places. Should we go ahead and overlay the intersection and and uh, redo the detection loops and things of that nature? So that would give us kind of a fresh looking intersection from the DDI through Marshall and McCaslin. Okay. And then the fourth, if we want to look at the ultimate, you know, provide all the other, you know, relocate all the other poles, all the curb and gutter, this is what you would probably add another uh, $400,000 to do the ultimate. So I'm laying all this out and just uh, letting you know. Do you want to proceed now? Do you want to wait? Do you want to go after some additional funding to get money and do the ultimate? You know, we have some time before the DDI starts. It's probably going to start next year, uh, and it won't be done for a couple of years. So we have some time. Maybe to go get some, some other funding to supplement this. Maybe the town center is further along that we get some funding from them that maybe you want to wait and look at what we can get to, to move towards the ultimate. So that's the What's that number f in number five? Add northbound right turn lane. Where is that? Over here. Yeah, where where is that on on that map? Oops. Is, is, this, is, is this right turn lane here? That exists now, but because we're adding a northbound through lane. We're just moving, we're moving this curving gutter out. Okay. And then add, adding an island and adding a through lane here. And that, again, increases the uh, capacity. You don't have to provide as much green time to the, to the northbound through lane. So going back to the other one. Cost. So that delta is roughly half a million dollars from option two to option four, right? Here to there, yeah. Yes, yeah. it's about five hundred thousand with the overlay. Yeah. And where could we get uh, extra funding? Would that be um, C dot or um, Dr. Cobb? Dr. Cobb. Mm -hmm. I think that the chances of getting uh, for these two items, the bike lane and the new traffic light. This is a multimodal thing. We're going after a, a bike lane and so forth. So this is easier to get than you know capacity improvements. Dr. Cobb doesn't like those types of improvements. 
and any idea what the mobilization savings of doing it all at one time would be just to have it fall apart? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that they're, they're, yeah, and that could be reduced probably 10, 20 percent by doing it all at once versus piecemeal. And do we want to coordinate this to be before, during, or after the DDI construction? I'd like to coordinate with it. I'd like to go back. I'd like to get all this done because that ties right into the DDI. And you want that done first, or you want it all done? Well, it could be. It, maybe we negotiate with the selected contractor that, hey, we'll give you some money. You know, do these improvements all the way down to Marshall. You know, moving this curve. It's really moving this out, moving that out. They're up. They're up here now, and then come back and maybe do an overlay of this. So at least this. That portion is is done in conjunction with the DDI. And do you know when the contractor for the DDI will be selected? Do you have an idea? I think what what the the current plan is to, the proposals I think are due in March, and they'll probably take two or three months to you know select a team and negotiate. So they're probably looking at mid mid this year July or so to have a team on board, and then they're, they'll have to go through the design. It's design build, so they're not going to start construction right away, but they'll probably be, be early next year before you see actual construction out there. Early of 14. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometime after the sometime after the 2013 holiday season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Alex, uh, I, there's been at least three iterations of this since I've been on the board, this being the third. I'd, I'm interested if you have them so we can sort of visualize what's changed. And then I'm interested in your opinion of which you considered the best option. The, the best option? In terms of your profession. You're the traffic well, guy. I probably would have, from a traffic engineering standpoint, I probably would have liked the one in the median. The one in what? The one where we take the median, the median third out. Lane, the third lane in the. In Do you the have that option handy so we can see what it looked like? Here, will we take this lane here? We take the additional lane out of the median, mm -hmm. and we have the two lanes, the through lane, and the, and the right turn. Lane. And tell us why you like that one. Well, you know, we're not we're not taking this. You know, that's right. going going way back. We're modifying this. Um, in the interim, we don't have that that issue of the the through lane down here that has has to go across a little offset. And how are the um, on Marshall? How are the Westbound and eastbound lanes separated without that median. What's going to divide the lanes? Right now, there's median here now. No, I mean on, on the, the other side. side. On the west side. If you if you made a lane, the one that you're taking out, the median that you're taking out. There's still be a small median. Uh, yeah. Be yeah, there'd curve. be a, a four foot median instead of a twelve foot median. Okay. Yeah. In your opinion, can that be made somewhat appealing? So yeah. that it looks I feel like concrete. <laughs> <laughs> cannot have nice uh, brickwork in it or, or you know? brickwork. Uh, isn't, uh, is the plan to make it that those silly concrete prefab things that are on I-25? What's what's the plan? Well, I would, yeah, I, those are barriers. We would make it as aesthetic as we we could do. It's not out of my. Yeah, it's going to be hard state, not yeah. Cool. Yeah, so. exactly. But there are ways to make hardscape a little bit better, sort of like around the roundabout. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to have it be awful. But you can't have trees in a four no. foot. No. So to me, that's not an option. Well, I, I think we're giving up a lot. I'm a big fan of those trees, and certainly was one who pushed this to the next iteration, but I don't know that it's. You're giving up some stuff. So what is the um, 2000, maybe, I don't know if anybody can answer this, what's the 2014 budget for capital look like? We have, we have the budget. Well, actually, we have the budget. At some point. Yeah. 
because we'll have a, a big, this is going to be another big push on local street repair, right? Right. Yeah. In 2013. Yeah. <coughs> I'm actually. Well, well, this isn't SMID. Again, this isn't SMID, so it's oh, probably not right. affecting okay. the rest of the town. You're right. The town because budget. those are dedicated You're right. Okay. right. And it's, and this is. The ultimate improvements I see is being, you know, if we proceed with them in the next couple of years in conjunction with DDI, it's something we could pay back by if the town center goes, because a lot of these are really uh, driven by the traffic coming from the town center. So, let's see, so SMID goes all the way over to, how far does that go over, do you know? Uh, the boundary, does it cross? <laughs> I'm not sure how far past on the east side, of, but it goes on the east side of McCaslin, but I'm not sure. It does. Is. Yeah. But so the town center, center was going to be in mid, weren't they? Right, and the town center was town center. Yeah, so, yeah, so it does. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, um, and we were saving a um, fair amount from what we thought we were going to expend on the interchange, right? Correct. So we should have some cash reserve in there, don't we? Yes. That could cover all of this, I would imagine. Yes. How much savings did we occur on the DDI compared to what we thought? A couple million? Well, um, let's say a million and a half, but okay. that's just... Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we currently have enough um, fund balance to cover our costs, but we're Pro, we're making those payments over three years, so um, that fund balance increases over those three years as well. So yeah, if you look at the three-year budget, I mean, it's we had three last year. We had three point seven million or whatever budgeted for thirteen, right? And that's going to be spread over three years. So and we're paying back HPTE, right? Is mm -hmm. that to the who we're yeah yeah okay. And is, um, are we going to have any impact on this and the DDI as far as funding from CDOT and how they're changing, how their cash flow is working? Uh, say that again? I'm sorry. He knows what I'm talking about. Well, CDOT's not putting any money into this at all. We did get Dr. Cog faster money. Yeah, we got yeah, but we didn't for get the RTD and for the RTD. Right. But that's, yeah, we didn't get any. That, those are just the ramps. Right. Okay. That's All right, so that won't, even if we tried to get uh, funding from CDOT for this particular project, is that possible? Right. Um, yeah, I think it's certainly uh, eligible with the bike lanes to get some funding out of Dr. Cog. It's just okay. how they program their funds. and That's different. It, from it, 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 everything's yeah. probably spoken for through 2018, you know, the way yeah. five years down the road. And maybe funds for the underpass portion of it? Well, I think for the trail connection, <laughs> for the trail yeah. connection, we would look, be looking at that. But we're not getting any funds from CDOT for any of these projects. No, which is, uh, yeah. yeah. So every single interchange on the US 36 corridor, except for this, gets money. Ah. Like most, I know, it's like unbelievable. The majority of it, right? Maybe all of it. Why is that? I, I don't because, know. Because uh, the bridge, bridges were felt to be, uh, there's some bridge fund, right, where they were felt to be, um, there's some terminology, but failing in some way so that they qualified for replacement. But wasn't CDOT the ones that said, oh, hey, we really want this forward-thinking DDI, so yeah, we'll, we'll fund the research to have, uh, you know, a... a <coughs> See if it's feasible. So you, we kind of thought that they would be on board as far as funds went, you know? Didn't we build CDOT in this, in this payment plan for the DDI? No. We didn't build them in? No. Well, we tried they to tried. get funding. We couldn't get funding. We mm. tried to encourage them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the purpose tonight is just to so my, I guess so. So the plan and if we got the cash, why wouldn't we? And we're pretty confident that the, this is how everything is going to line up in 10 years. It seems like we should just do it as opposed to trying to come back 
do some more work, do another overlay because it would have to be overlaid again, presumably. So that would be my perspective. Is there, what's the board's opinion? Is the slip ramp an improvement over this one? The right turn? Taking out the median or having the slip ramp? Yeah, this is. And in terms of the slip this ramp. This is version two right and the slip ramps version three, right? Yeah, I mean, I think from my perspective, it's a, it's better to preserve the meeting going into the town center. I mean, into the marketplace. I agree. And we have to have a slip ramp. <laughs> what, what did you say, Joe? I said we have to have a slip ramp. We have to have the, the turn. And it's going to be in that no matter what, right? Even if we took the, even if we took the median out at on Mar uh, Marshall we would still have to do some form of right turn lane movement, right? Yeah. At the ultimate design. Yeah. On which corner? <laughs> so it's, uh, we, we don't need to found Marshall turning right. No, I mean, right now, that's how it is now. We're not changing anything here. No, no, but in the long term plan, the ultimate design, we would have to have something there, right? Or no? No. So that would, you would not have to carve back mm -hmm. anymore. The problem with that one, mm -hmm. as I see it, is there's only one through lane, right? Going into the town center. That's, yeah, we've looked at that. Um, and that's all you really need. I mean, because there's, there's not that much traffic that's going back and forth. I mean, right now we have less than 50 an hour, and it's going to go to like three or 400 an hour. And in this type of intersection, you can handle up to eight or nine hundred an hour in one, with the one lane. So we don't anticipate needing a second lane going across. Even if the town center, mm -hmm. really? Yeah, if you remember at the town center, you know, you only have so much over here. A lot of the town centers, you know, further down. So, Joe, did you uh, weigh in on the side of the slip ramp? Well, no, I was, I'm just trying to understand what Alex just said. We don't need to I've, back up again. So we take we don't take out the medium. How do you go south on McCaslin from uh, on Marshall from Marshall if you're heading east? Heading east or heading whatever you, whatever that direction is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you need the median in place. We yeah. create this slip lane. Okay, what well, if you don't create that? What's the? Well, how do you get go south on McCaslin? You you're you're joining with the through lane mm -hmm. up until the stoplight, and then right here you do a right on red. You do a right on red like you do now, except that you are. Uh, you're, you're also sharing that with the through traffic now. Not in this case. No, we have well, right turn lane. Yeah, that's correct to a certain point. Right, Alex? Mm -hmm. up, and, share, up until there. Up until right, uh, right about there. Right about there. You can this share. This is a through lane. Right. What is there, what, what's there right now? The, the, is that cut? I can't remember. It's the same it's as, as it is back. now. Right? You, have, you have two two lanes. One stays a through lane all the way through. Uh -huh. One becomes a left turn. That's what's out there now. And is it cut back on the south side there? I just, I just don't remember. On and the you, curb, on yeah, the south, yeah. south, go all the way. Yeah. Yes. That, that's already there. This is already there. That's where the right turn lane is. Okay. So the entire triple, third lane to make the triple left comes out of the median. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Correct. the rest is unaffected. Yeah. I have to say this intuitively makes more sense to me assuming we can make that median somewhat copacetic uh, along along the way. I think we're giving up, up a lot of aesthetic appeal with that slip ramp cutting into that Conoco turn. I do feel we're going to have that leapfrogging uh, thing going on there as well um, with the slip ramp in there. It may not be exactly how I describe it in my scenario, but I need to see little micro cars 
on a model with all this, but my instinct uh, favors this one. I think I prefer this design, but I'm not sure I prefer taking out the trees. <laughs> And I, you know, so that's the trade-off of creating the slip lane or, the, or leaving the trees. And I'm not thrilled by the slip lane, so I don't know. Can I see the um, the picture where, or the graphic, where you have the ultimate in, involved here? Okay. And so that right, hard to envision. The right turn lane comes all the way. I, I can visualize, visualize that very well, actually. <laughs> Um, but you're saying that that's already there in that configuration? No, not in this one. Not in this no, one. It doesn't not go all the way back. This is <laughs> isn't that what's? No. That's what I was trying to ask. That's what's there presently. Right now, this is what's there. Mm -hmm. Right. And then we're taking that all the way back, back to second. Uh -huh. Yeah. See, what I've asked to see is um, so, the whole kit and caboodle. Basically. The nine mile, you know, almost a million dollar package yeah. instead of the $255,000 package. And I just wanted to see how the configuration is on the From ultimate here, package it, it kind of with, past. without taking the median, mm -hmm. the middle oh. median. This right. is without yeah. taking this the middle median. So, Alex, like that uh, little juncture on the top is the same as this juncture on the bottom, right? Uh, it's coming back here. It's sycamores here. So you're starting, right. this is probably third, third. That's third? Yeah. And this one down here is second? Okay. Uh, no, this one's second. Second. That's so this line here goes right there. Right. So we just wanted to show it. So it's the same juncture there. Yeah. This line is this line. So, so. to me, this design with the ultimate package, I don't know how best to describe that, but I'm going to call it the ultimate package, um, makes more sense to me. It's almost exactly what Sandy and um, Joe want uh, with the other design where they're taking out the median, but that's without the ultimate package. I, to me, the ultimate package actually restores order, in, in my opinion, in this, in this whole scenario. Do you understand? Yeah. No, the medians is. And I, I think if we're pretty sure this is going to match up well with the town center and everything, what the mayor was saying of going for the whole Kahuna makes sense. Because you don't want to. Yeah, I think if we choose this option, going for the whole Kahuna makes sense. But I just am still concerned about that slip ramp there and the functionality of it. Because the other one, you, you come off your in your right lane. And it's easy to shift left to go south to where we all live. So here, Alex, how I, I agree with the the micro car here. So how much would that cost you to show us what that would look like in the two different configurations? Excuse to me. To get a model. To uh, a traffic model, a visual. Oh sure. Yeah. A simulation. Would that be? For Bart. Uh, Probably four to five hundred. Oh, but I have a, you know I have a model there. I love those so much. I, I think we said before we really weigh in. I think that. I think that that would be good. To You're see. talking about a model like a racetrack set, right? Yeah. Like, like we saw the DDI. Yes. Like we saw the DDI that one yeah. time. And okay. showing projected traffic. Right. Like Can we see it with this ultimate? Yeah. Sure. Package exactly this. and the um, the two. package where there is no center median. Right. Yeah. Uh, and also the one where um, there is a median, but it's not the ultimate package yet. We're getting there. Those right. three. Okay. So, what, yeah. was, what was that third one? I guess I the question is, is the, 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 the question is whether or not you want to go through the interim step or yes, you, you want to just go straight to the final build out. And the final no, build out is the almost a million dollars. So either you do it in the stages or you, you just go all the way to but the very end. Were you seeing the previous version of number three? Mm -hmm. And number two, version A of number three, and version B of number three? Correct. OK, yeah. So I can the reason why I'm, I'm saying that is should you not want to spend that kind of money, you would need to look at the options that cost relatively the same amount. I think I can, on number three, 
I can, if I see full scale number three, I think I can visually pare it down. But if it's no, not a big deal, do all three. I want to give you guys a break. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Good work. Yeah. No kidding. So, um, when when would you think that you'd be coming back to look at this some more? I don't think it's almost take on the simulation. It might be like a month or so. Okay. So, yeah, maybe it's a kind of short. So, that gives us plenty of time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Great, thanks. Uh, that brings to item number three, approval of the agenda. The managers let me know that uh, he would like to have a separate discussion about uh, what was 7F. And does anybody else want to pull something from the consent agenda? Trustee Williams. Uh, yes, I want to pull uh, C, D, E, H, and I. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Uh, and Is there anything left? I don't know. G. Yes. Yeah. He's looking uh, good. And A and B. G A and B. Would you like to uh, maybe move the proclamation Apps. up ahead of? Sure. Since That's fine. Sure. That makes that makes sense. Sure. So that uh, the pro uh, presentations will um, follow two, I guess. Actually, follow three. Okay. Any other changes? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda with those changes. I'll make a motion with whatever is left of <laughs> the consent agenda. Trustee Gregor is second by Trustee Williams. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. That brings us to uh, presentations. And uh, tonight we have a proclamation from Monarch High School. Let's see. Is there anybody who wants to? Well, unless you're expecting other people to come at 7.45, are you good? Can we go now? Uh, yeah, that's, I just pulled that up. Um, so tonight I'm pleased to have um, the Monarch High School football team, members of the team and coaching staff are here tonight um, so that we can celebrate um, their accomplishments that they uh, had in 2012. Um, uh, the state football championship uh, team is here tonight. They uh, defeated Denver South High School. Um, by the score of 17 to 14 in, in 2012, and it's a great uh, accomplishment. I'm glad they're able to come tonight, and, and, um, and we can present them with this proclamation. Um, in addition to the, the state football championship, um, they also um, their coach Bill Bravo was uh, uh, honored to be the high school coach of the year in 2012. Um, they also uh, were awarded the 2012. Team Sportsmanship Award from the uh, Mountain League Conference. Um, they have been the four-time consecutive Mountain League Conference champions, and as well as that, they had uh, their 2012 Player of the Year Award that was awarded to Ethan Marks from the Mountain League Conference team in the Denver Post. So they're here tonight um, to receive a proclamation from us and get some photos and Great. just um, say congratulations to them, as well as the whole Monarch High School team yeah, we're, can't, we're pleased to have our kids going to that high school, and it's a great school. And it's a great honor to, to have. Great. Time. So, congratulations, gentlemen. Um, with that, I'd like to read a proclamation of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior. In appreciation of the Monarch High School 2012 football team, whereas the Monarch High School 2012 football team won the, uh, is it Chessa? Uh, CHSAA Class 4A State Football Championship on December 1st, 2000, uh, December 1st, 2012, and Coach Phil Bravo won the 2012 Coach of the Year Award from the Denver Post and the Denver Broncos and the Mountain League Conference Team Coaches, and the Monarch High School 2012 Football Team won the 2012 Team Sportman Sportsmanship Award from the Monarch uh, from the Mountain League Conference. And player Ethan Marks won the 2012 Player of the Year Award from the Denver Post and the Mountain League Conference. And the Monarch High School team represented the Town of Superior with courage and pride and reflected intercommunity cooperation through fostering positive relationships. Therefore, I, Andrew Muckle, Mayor of the Town of Superior, and the Board of Trustees do hereby proclaim its appreciation to the Monarch High School football 2012 team for their significant contri uh, contribution to the community through these accomplishments and for their fine example of citizenship. Congratulations. <laughs> well, this would be a great time for some photos. Yeah, and I didn't know Coach probably wanted to say anything. Yeah. Or, well, I'm not prepared, but I will. <laughs> if, if you wouldn't mind, just set the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank we just, you. We'd like a good halftime speech. <laughs> 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 well, thank you very much, Lisa, for putting this together, and we're very proud of our school, and we're proud of our kids, and tonight we have our, our some of our seniors here tonight. I'll introduce them to you as Cole Watson on my right. He's our starting quarterback. 
and then Connor Fitzgerald is started at tight end and defensive end. Henry Oliver started at offensive guard. Um, Colin Hart started at inside linebacker and was also um, the Mountain League MVP as well as linebacker. Will represent us in the All-State game in Alamosa this coming uh, June. And then Levi Ensign was a starting offensive guard. And then Jeff Clary is um, the third Clary for us to coach. I uh, coach his other, uh, older brothers, Matthew and Nick. And uh, Matthew actually was a part of our 2002 championship team. And Jeff uh, played defensive back and was our punter. And then Andrew Dorsey played tight end for us. And Josh Hurst played offensive tackle and defensive tackle for us. Great. So we're very happy. It does a lot to our school and our community just to breathe that type of enthusiasm. And um, we're very proud of our student athletes. We have um, just great academic focus on our campus and as well on our football team. And to get there was one thing, but to win it was just it was pretty courageous. Our kids did a great job. And we're, we're very happy. So thank you for all that you do, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I know there's a lot of uh, Mustang. I don't know if anybody here played Mustang football. Oh, yeah. We have but uh, yeah. I know there are a lot of Mustang football players in the town of Superior who are pretty excited about uh, hopefully joining your team in the, in the future. So thank great. you for a great really organization. Good. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, guys. Thank and you. thanks so, for thank all you, you do at the high school. I have two daughters that go to school there, and oh, they great. love you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank so maybe, you. Uh, Let's see, can we do a photo with yeah, everybody yeah, up here? Yeah. yeah. That'd be great. You guys all want to do it with them? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Let's everybody come down. Well, guys, in the back of all. Yeah, we're feeling like tall now. Yeah. Thank you very much for having us here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Pat, Pete, yeah. And Brady, we love them. Good kids. Great kids, yeah. Hi, thank you for your advice. Who are your daughters? Rachel Williams and Samantha Williams. My boys have been seeing this, so we're very Thank you so much. It's really great. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Can I get up here? Beer in the middle? No, no, I'm good. I'm going to get up here, too. 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 I'm going to snap a couple, okay? So one, two, three. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank We hope so. We hope so. Thank you once again. Thank you, Coach. Thank you. You guys are welcome to stay here. Oh, yeah. It looks like it may be longer than I just paid. Yeah. So, um, can we give them to you or bring them yeah. to the principal? Or what's, what would be the best way to do that? You give them to me, I'll give them to you. Okay, great. We have our. Um, we have a ring ceremony where we, the boys get their championship rings in okay. April. So okay. for the kids I don't miss, I'll catch them at them. Great. All right. All right. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good luck this year, too. Okay. Let's see. Now I have to get uh, reorganized here. So, so everything's pulled, but G and A and We'll find, we'll find out shortly. All right, uh, that brings to item number four, reports, questions, and issues. Uh, Trustee Hanson isn't here this evening. Trustee Sorelli, would you like to start? Um, let me see. I have um, just about uh, nothing to report except thank yous to uh, Sandy. Did the Historical Commission meet? The meeting go okay? It did. I'll, I'll give a few brief notes. Thank you very much for covering that for me. And I'm going to be out of town next week from the 2nd through the 9th, so Trustee Hansen will be covering the next Rocky Flat Stewardship Council meeting, which is on February 4th at 8 a.m. over at the airport, if anybody's interested in attending that. Are you going to Washington, D.C.? I'm going to, no, I'm going to Utah next week, Washington. Washington, D.C. trip, the lobbying trip, is 
from the 12th to the 14th of February. Of February. So uh, I'm paying a price of not being here for Valentine's Day until late, but <laughs> we'll see. Uh, I had two things to pass on that really aren't much in the way of reports, but I have had many unofficial uh, statements of appreciation for our extended street light, uh, uh, Christmas lights, be showing that that's, that's been nice. And uh, those of you who uh, um, received your property taxes this past week and may have attained the uh, great age of 65 or above, there is something that called the senior property tax exemption, which I did some research on all too late. But for future reference, as you approach age 65, you need to apply for that exemption by July of the year prior to that, to the tax year where it's applicable. And then if it's funded, it would, uh, it takes away 50% of the first $200,000 of the value of your property. So essentially, most homes in Superior that would take $100,000 off their property assessment. Um, hmm. So it's worth being aware of that. And as you approach 865, apply in July. We got to wait. By July. Here. How does that translate to the actual you know, property taxes? Well, I didn't do the math because I didn't do it on time. I'll pay more attention next year. <laughs> Whatever the tax rate is per per a thousand times a hundred, it's what you say. Um, but I wanted people to know that that rate is not that exemption is not always funded. It hadn't been funded the prior couple of years because of our austere state budgets. But if you do apply for this and actually get it approved. It's forever approved, so if they don't fund it, it come, you don't have to reapply. It comes, comes in automatically. So I just thought I'd make that public ser service announcement to those 64-year-olds out there so they don't miss a year. <laughs> and that's all I have. Great, thanks. Uh, I attended one meeting, and then we're going to cover that basically in 7-H, um, but it had to do with the RTD, Northwest Area Mobility Study, which um, I'll just list what it's going to do uh, in case anybody's interested, but uh, determine how remaining Fast Tracks US 36 bus rapid transfer <coughs> commitment will be spent, evaluate potential for construction the Northwest Rail in segments as opposed to building it in entirety to um, Boulder, evaluate overall mobility options in the Northwest area, so that's basically how would buses, additional bus um, work in that, our area. Evaluate potential north <laughs> metro extension to Longmont. So that would be the plan was to have uh, rail to Longmont going connected to Boulder. Now they're thinking it might make more sense to have them run up I-25 and cut over to Longmont as opposed to going through Boulder. So, and then uh, just a high level because high level means no money uh, has been allocated, but to the uh, basically at uh, 36 and I-25 where the uh, they share a um, multimodal lane there, how to do that in a bi-directional way in the future. Um, I can't imagine how that would actually occur, but just um, to analyze that. So that's the only meeting I had. And then uh, I had one question for staff, which is with the new uh, bus shelters, which I think look pretty good. But uh, who takes care of the maintenance of that? Is RTD? No, on tap for that, or is that no, us? No, that, that'll be us. And um, we've already spoken with Vargas, who's our landscape contractor, and they, um, they've given us a, a very low, reasonable price to do that on a monthly basis. Because so. it looks like it needs a little yeah, sprucing that, up. That one on the uh, east side there got some paintball action on it, so we have to get that cleaned up. So. Okay. All right, that's all I had. Betsy Williams. So I attended a couple meetings. Um, the first one is a Louisville Library um, Board of Trustees meeting. And uh, I uh, attended that for Trustee um, Pennington. And 
the only the major thing to note here is there's something they have a program called I help and this is um, student helpers that help um, the public uh, be t more tech savvy when it comes to uh, looking up things at the library, using ebooks, uh, downloading any kind of um, digital media. And so at this point, they currently they hold it somewhere in. Um, Louisville and they change it here and there. Sometimes it's at the Cannon Mine coffee shop. Um, and I think they're going to change it and we might think about maybe having it in Superior one or two times. But what they're, they really need student helpers. So any, I probably should have mentioned it while we had the high school footballers here. Um, we really need student helpers. And it's a Wednesday morning, which is perfect because all the kids have late start. It's from 8 to 9.30, somewhere in that range. Um, so uh, if you want to get the word out, maybe either the bulletin, the CAC, the e-blast, in our newsletter, probably the news newsletter would be good. Um, but. High school students would be best. There may be some really tech savvy um, middle schoolers that could help too. So um, that's my one little plug here for Louisville Library. Uh, the other meeting I attended was uh, Dr. Cog, Denver Regional Council of Governments. And I have a number of uh, important things to um, inform you. First of all, they have a workshop. It's in Colorado Springs next month. And this is on every year they have a, a yearly workshop, kind of like a, a retreat in some ways. Um, town staff is allowed to come, any elected official, um, even the public is allowed to come if you want to come to Colorado Springs. It's, this time it's on uh, transportation policy. We're trying to refine the policy as far as um, the, the TIP, which is the Transportation Improvement Program. Um, they're also working on the MetroVision 2040 um, plan. Um, and there's a number of advisory um, committee, uh, citizen advisory committees, that they'll be soliciting for. Um, and obviously staff should be uh, probably aware of that. Uh, I don't know if you've received anything from them on that. I will, I will forward something over. Um, the other thing, let's see, I'll just give a quick synopsis of um, Fast Tracks was just an implementation of commuter rail and light rail in the Denver metro area. Everyone probably knows what Fast Tracks is. Uh, and there's just a small bit of BRT. And it was voted in by the people, I think it was in 2004? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that kind of fell apart in our corridor uh, because of BNS or BNSF Railroad Company that decided not to share their rail in a very cooperative manner. In other words, they raised the costs above the voter-approved threshold. So I'm going to be the BNSF uh, advocate, advocate here. Is that I'm not sure that RTD explored that very well before they understood <laughs> what they were getting into. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so. Here we are, um, fast forward, and so based on that activity, um, the Senate Bill 208 report uh, for Fast Tracks is not in what they call fiscal conformity. And in doing so, RTD and Dr. Cog um, have removed the Northwest Rail um, from the fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. And before you, you know, get all freaked out. Um, it doesn't mean that the rail won't come. What it means is financially they had to remove it um, in order to be um, in conformity with their financial plan. So at this point, um, any change that occurs as an addition or a deletion of any component of Fast Tracks has to go to a vote of the people. So if they decide they're not doing rail, in the corridor, it would have to be a vote to the people, as I understand it. Am I correct? So the um, you're looking at me funny. No, no. So the the uh, Northwest uh, Mobility Study is actually going to be entered into the 2000. What is it? And I'm, I'm getting to that analysis. And part of that is whether or not rail could be segmented. Um, it's been 
um, difficult to. The problem is that BNSF as a company that makes money, which uh, that's what they're there to do, is that exactly can't necessarily commit to a price for a segment if it's so far out that they can't understand what mm -hmm. the economy would be at that time. So a lot of the study is going to see if segmentation works, but right. So what I was. That kind of just segues into what RTD is conducting a, a Northwest Area Mobility Study, um, and that includes all the Northwest Corridor partners, elected officials, all staff um, for municipalities, counties. Um, that includes us, and they'll determine what what do we do next, what are our options, and can we get consensus in our corridor? In other words, can everyone agree? So that will be an interesting process, um, and I assume that we will be a big part of that process because it doesn't just include um, rail or light rail or whatever they come up with in the rail aspect. It does include BRT, whether it is true BRT, BRT or just uh, some sort of variation of what they call BRT, um, which is bus rapid transit, um, where you feel like you're on a train. Um, but maybe not. Um, so anyway, that, you were talking about that anyway already, so I'll move I on. Add, you know, I could add one other thing. So Great. just some uh, additional information is that RTD is anticipating the, the BRT local service, so not the express service from Boulder to Denver, or I think there's an express service from Superior, Louisville to Denver as well. Mm -hmm. The local service will be actually, uh, during congestion, will be run on the uh, shoulder and they got approval from FHWA to have that happen. So yeah. um, we'll see how that goes. I did ask at the last meeting that the um, boundary of the study actually would go out and include um, transit service to the airport. So they're supposed to be analyzing that as well. Um, I think that's from, from, from Superior? From Superior. Basically from the corridor, but my hope would be that it would include the Superior Louisville or perhaps the Broomfield so direct, from here to, the direct to the airport. So you would get a full bus pulling up to our bus stop right? as you try to get on. Mm -hmm. And we've been talking about that mm -hmm. in the past. So um, so here's a, there's a couple other things here. Um, there's a proposal to um, change HOVs from two plus cars or two plus people in a car to three plus people in a car. Um, that would go into effect in 20, 2015, somewhere between 2015 and 2024, um, in the fact that it does have to be approved. Uh, at this point, um, it would be after the managed lanes would be extended on US 36 to Boulder and I-25 to 120th Avenue. Um, and there is a public hearing at Dr. Cog this next month February, I think it's February 1st already. Um, it's not, but it's close. Uh, so there is a, another hearing on that. Um, if anyone's interested in going to Dr. Cog to discuss any, you know, anything about the HOVs, changing from 2 plus to 3 plus, you might want to attend. My guess is that HPTE is going to lobby heavily to have the uh, plus the three, uh, because it increases the revenue uh, in the corridor, which um, various people have been hoping that if you have some of that increased revenue, it'll pay back the indebtedness faster, mm -hmm. but also could potentially then fund some mobility enhancements. I and it increases revenue because one-person cars and two-person cars will choose to take the toll, the the and they will pay to do so. Well, and also what this does is this is encouraging. Um, multimodal transit so that you would do alternative transportation instead of driving your car because the you know a three plus would be more enticing than only two um, in the fact that you're going to have to now pay if you're going to be in and there's only two of you in the car you're going to have to pay unless it's a good way to increase revenue yeah Exactly. Well, I don't, it's a good way to reduce vehicle miles traveled, which is what Dr. Cog is trying to do. That's one of their goals. U.S. 36 mayors, just as an, also as an FYI, is that, it, that if the U.S. 36 corridor goes to uh, three plus HOV, that we would like that to occur at the same time the rest of the state's 
HOV lanes change to that number. And so this is this proposal is the Colorado High Performance Transportation Enterprise. So I'm assuming that is for the entire state of Colorado. Well, the initially it was talked about just on the 36th quarter, but that's why we were asking HBTE to make sure that that happens statewide. And I think they need to be concerned about the law of unintended consequences because uh, right now they've been very deliberate about vehicle miles traveled and reducing that. That's easy to do to find one buddy to carpool with. But when uh, you now have to find two to do so, you may be inclined to find nobody and just go by yourself. So I think there's going to be some slippage in the efficiencies we've accomplished thus far. I, I, as a experience I've had with in the D.C. area, Northern Virginia going into D.C., their HOV lane, I think, had required four passengers. And they didn't have a pay option. It was... HOV4, or that was it. Hmm. It was very typical that people would be waiting on the highway and cars would be looking to take people in. <laughs> I'm serious. Wow. And picking up people to go in to his, <laughs> into the city with them to just to be in the, well, the, the traffic is such a, such a lot of them that huh. you'd do anything oh to God. get into the HOV lane at, at rush hour. So. <laughs> It's so that is it's what hiking. It's not, it wasn't. It was not not as bad as that. I mean, it was like it was a kind of a, a safe way of doing it. But people would kind of hang around and get picked up. And, well, and could you choose who you you know, went with or no? Well, you just you know, try to Don't get stop. destination. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, I attended a transportation or traffic safety committee meeting, and I'm going to let these two talk about that because I'm near complete here. Um, I also have a First Fridays event, um, my Donuts with Deb, every First Friday of the month, which is this Friday, February 1st. It's at Juju Bakery Cafe um, right by Superior on Colton Road, and it's from 7.30 to 9.30 a.m., the first Friday of every month. I will be there. And I usually throw in a topic of the month, and this month is transportation. The transportation plan for the Town of Superior, we'll be talking about it all week in several meetings, um, and uh, as well as on Friday. Uh, of course, as always, if you have other issues, please bring them to talk about um, at my first Fridays, Donuts with Deb. Uh, I also, um, there is, I wanted to big, give a big plug for a huge event that we have going on. Uh, it's a lecture and book signing with Kristen Iverson. She's the author of Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Nuclear Shadow of Rocky Flats. And that is Wednesday, February 6th at 7 p.m. It is at the Key Bank Equipment Building up at the top of McCaslin and Rock Creek Parkway. Um, please stop by, bring your book. There will be a few books for sale, um, but not very many. Uh, so uh, there's books at uh, Barnes & Noble in Boulder, in Westminster, um, Pretty much in any Barnes and Noble, there's plenty of books available. I've been calling around, and that's it. Thank you, Trustee Gogers. I attended the uh, grand opening of 100% Chiropractic uh, last week. Um, it's situated between Tutti Frutti, <coughs> basically, and Sears in the marketplace. Dr. Michael Tinky and his wife and. Um, if you haven't been there, it's probably one of the most beautiful offices you've ever seen. You feel like you're walking in a, in a designer showcase, uh, living with very much, it feels like home. Uh, very personable, just just a wonderful addition, I think, to our business community. It's much, it's needed. Uh, they have x-rays, they have massage, they have, I mean, it's almost like a wellness center, if you will. So if you don't have a chiropractor, if you, or if you're looking to find a chiropractor closer to home, I suggest you give them a, give them a try. It was very well attended, too. Um, we had a transportation safety committee meeting at 5 o'clock today with Alex and Lisa. They did a great job presenting us with uh, several items. The one that stands out is the, uh, they did a study on the existing 
speed limit at certain uh, streets. Um, <laughs> and I learned something. That, so the posted speed limit is typically based on the 85th percentile travel speed of free-flowing vehicles, which I did not know that. So for the most part, the Colton Road uh, west of Indiana, Colton Road east of Indiana, Indiana Street, both south and north of Colton Road, those were, the, the studies show that the numbers were within um, the mileage that's posted. The Rock Creek Circle south of um, Colton Road, which basically is if you, it, it goes past Yarrow, two Yarrows basically, and uh, Castle Peak and Torrey Peak, I think. Interestingly enough, if the posted limit is 35, the average speed was uh, was 31, which is quite a bit lower. So as we discussed this in our recommendation to the board is maybe to reduce the speed limit from 35 to 30, since that's what it appears that everybody else, all the other areas, they're going faster than the speed limit, which is pretty <laughs> normal, you know, between five and six miles per hour, except for that. And so you have the townhomes on the, on the north side, I guess, and you have all of those streets that you can turn left in, right? So that's our thoughts. That's the only change that we would want to see made at this time. And I mean, that's kind of open to discussion too. I don't know how you guys feel about that. It seems like that's how fast cars are going already, so we might as well reduce the speed limit to 30. <coughs> if okay. there are no objections, of that's what we recommended. Okay, great. Any other thoughts on the transportation? Uh, well, I think the the attitude about Rock Creek Circle, I think we very reluctantly tinker with speed limits. But right. um, the all the residential roads, unless posted, we were informed are 25 miles per hour. And because that has more of the feel of a residential road, I presume that's the, the reason that we speed demons are not taking full advantage of that 35 miles an hour. So um, that um, and the road is very short <laughs> in, in being able to get your speed up. Well, I don't know that it's that short. I mean, you go past that the doesn't seem to hold me back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you coming down the hill, they're going faster. Yeah, yeah going that's past the car dealership, right. going up, yeah. going west, no. if you will. That's it, it takes a little while, it. and then people are turning on the two Yarrows and Castle right. Peak. So, yeah. so I think it, it just seems to make sense. Mall that one over, I guess. Yeah, we don't I mean, have to decide anything on it. And uh, the the other thing is, we received an email about solicitation in the town mm -hmm. a while back. And with a suggestion being that the town does not have a solicitation policy, I, that cannot be right. We do have one. So I, I know that we do, yeah. but would you mind just basically restating just very briefly what that is for those that are listening? Well, anybody that wants to solicit door to door has to get a permit from the clerk's office. And if they don't, okay. and they knock on your door, what uh, happens they then? Call the sheriff's office. Okay. What about uh, just uh, putting something on your knob? Okay. No, this was specifically about it, just knocking on the door and just. Mm -hmm. uh, and she she was also commenting that basically your front door is just littered with all kinds of paraphernalia that you know you're getting from solicitors, uh, whether it be on your um, garage door or whatnot or on the your sidewalk. And I agree. I mean, if I go a week, I'll have at least six or seven things sitting at my front door. Yeah, they, if they see them out there, they should call the sheriff's office. Yeah. Okay. So do we... Um, it's if, somewhat It's if, somewhat complicated, though. If you're walking up to the... I think the attorney would have to chime in here, but I think that if you... The violation would be, if you don't knock on the door, would be littering. And whether or not the sheriff's department is going to get involved in that, I don't know. Yes, that would be know. littering. There's also some some requirements about having a no solicitation sign if you don't want someone knocking. Um, that's helpful as well. Right. Um, so which is the which is the other thing? Even if you ha get a peddler's li license through the clerk's office, do we still have the no solicitation list? Yes, we do. So people could sign up for that as well. Yes. Right. So the one thing that I just want to know, Jim Payne is in, in, in the audience today from our HOA. So I responded back to Vanessa's email. She responded, and I said, we do have a solicitation because, you know, we, mm -hmm. here's her response. Thank you so much for replying to my question regarding soliciting in Rock Creek. I was directed to you by the Rock Creek HOA president. 
he told me that the Syrian superior does not, and that was capitalized, have a solicitation policy. So I think to your president, I think he needs to be corrected. I mean, obviously, that, that's <laughs> so that may be an education for him and for the Iraq Rick HOA in general to say, absolutely, there's a solicitation policy, and it does get enforced. Yeah. So when somebody is properly registered, do we give them a card mm -hmm. that identifies them as such? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And I know a lot of times, uh, like Monarch High School, mm -hmm. DECA makes money from doing this, and they probably rotate the people that are delivering those packages. Are they, um, I, I wonder if they're supplied with a, a card when they come out so that they don't have to, they can identify no. themselves as such. Each separate person should have a right. permit. Right. And, and, and by the way, just one more sentence from this email that may shed some light. He says solicitors are supposed to obtain permits, right, from you, but there's no policy against listing, and that's incorrect. That's incorrect. That's, yeah. So we just want to correct well, we that. Can, we want to correct that, that in the next newsletter. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask, Phyllis, do you get a lot of um, inquiries for permits? No. You do not? No, maybe 10, 15 per year. Yeah, and I had somebody knock on the door the other day, started doing his own spiel, and I said, no, I'm sorry, and he was actually kind of rude, like he was like offended that I didn't want to contribute more money to his cards, and I'm like, so it, that's gotten out of hand, I feel like, so we, per perhaps we need to start enforcing it more diligently, and that will uh, reduce the number of solicitors we have. Mm -hmm. that's, all, that's all I have. Yes, as long filled. as you don't go after the Girl Scout cookies. Okay. Well, those we contribute, we don't mind that, but... Well, and I'm wondering what what do we do? Town clerk, Phyllis. There, you don't need a solicitor's permit if you're just leaving a flyer and walking away. It's only if you knock on the door. No, they knocked on the door and was asking for money and just. But they were talking about the flyers. Right. We were. Right. We that is another issue. We give it that. Right. It is another issue, but we do not prohibit it. Unless you have a no trespass, trespass, no trespassing or no solicitation sign. But to be trespassing, I know that we went through this at nauseam for a while. You had to have a gate at your property line, right? Because or otherwise, a sign. if you have or, a sign saying no trespassing, then oh, oh is that right? Yes. Oh, probably the That's HOA different. wouldn't allow a sign <laughs> because it was. Um, I, I was told, or at least if I remember, they would not it's implied that if you didn't have a gate or something, that it, it's it's implied that it's uh, not public, but you're welcoming people to your door. That is the case unless there's a no trespassing or a no solicitor sign. Or anything conveying, as I say, conveying a similar message. Like a Doberman. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do have a gate or a fence or something that's closed. Right, they can't open that, right. <laughs> exactly. Anyway, it would be good to re-educate. I think it's been a few yeah. years since yeah. we have that. So that's all I have. Great. Trustee Penning. And just continuing that, Jim, maybe the same suggestion of an article in the HOA newsletter? And you probably should compare it with Matt's to make sure we're saying exactly the same thing in both of them. Um, uh, Traffic and Safety Committee, Dr. Cog, and uh, those have been already well reported. And Historical Commission, about the only thing that um, they had a full thing, but only thing that I think has uh, needs to be announced here today is once again. Um, Postag asked for their input on the naming of Town 9 Park, and they came up with a clear winner in terms of their suggestion, and I won't even tell you what it is, so that when it all comes forward, you're all unbiased. Um, they were also working through some uh, donation, uh, refinement of their donation policies. They had a little glitch there that they're trying to work out, and they will work it out, but um, that's about it. Right, and the museum will be open on Saturday, this first Saturday of the month? Always Saturday. open the first Saturday of the month after Deb's first Friday thing, and um, come. Great. Town manager. Uh, let's see. Um, looks like we'll end up uh, about 3.5% increase in sales tax revenue from the previous year. We don't have the final numbers in, but that's what it's looking. Uh, so that's good. Um, and we sent Bricksmore Blackstone their last um, payment for the year as part of our revenue sharing that we have with them. This is the highest it's ever been. So it's just, it's 
speaks to the sales tax and the sales revenue that's being generated off the marketplace, which continues to be a success. Um, the Boulder County Housing Authority has been out. They continue to look at a number of properties as a possible location for a mixed use 50, 60 unit senior housing type uh, project. So once um, we're going to try to meet with them this week to talk about some of the <coughs> properties and what the process would be uh, to work with them and, and through the development process. So I'll send you information about the updates as I get those. Uh, Martin and his staff continue to work with this promoter that's been discussing, you see in the paper, about a half marathon in town. We, there's still a number of issues that would have to be worked out, so we're not sure if that would take place or not. But yeah, if there's progress on it, I'll let you know and give you an idea of what the race course might look like. Um, this week we'll be sending the city of Louisville our uh, payment for library services per the IGA. Um, total amounts just a little more than 240000 What did we send them last year? Um, I think last year was 244000 Oh, really? I thought yeah. property taxes actually went up. Yeah, so. uh, uh, while there were some adjustments, every year there's adjustments for, and I can get you a breakdown okay. if you want to see it. But, uh, I thought it had gone yeah, up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Panera Bread's doing a little, some minor interior remodeling to their store, so that's good news. Um, Fusion IO, which is one of the tenants up at Superior Point office, is uh, <coughs> doing some uh, additional remodels to their office space for a data center. Guardian storage looks to be completed at the end of February. And um, let's see, Senator Nicholson is looking to have some town hall meetings over the next four months, starting in February. Once they're okay with releasing dates, we'll get information out to the public. So uh, they can attend if they would love. Um, and then I listed some information on. Um, this town hall meeting uh, call-in that the city of Longmont did last year, uh, maybe at the retreat, we can talk about that some more and, and see if that's how <coughs> if you want to do something like that or have a variation of it or something like that. But So I've, just to get you thinking about it, there's a website there you can go to and it it's, uh, has a video that explains how the process works as well. So. Does Longmont do it regularly? Last year was their first year, and I think they're going to go ahead and do it again this year. But they just do it once a year. So. Oh, just once a year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then retreat dates. Uh, Phyllis has sent some emails out looking for dates. Um, none of the dates at the end of this month worked. Nothing appears to work in February to get all seven board members there. So we are now looking in March, unless you want to look at a weekend date, a Saturday. That, but I know that's not been looked at too <laughs> uh, favorably. I, I would not, I yeah. not be in favor of that. So, so uh, then we will send out, we'll start with off Mondays in March and just go from there. Mm -hmm. How about the first Monday in March? It's March 4th. So uh, that will be the, yeah, we have a couple board members, the, uh, you know, Chris and Lisa will follow up. That'll okay. be the first one we'll have to check. Thanks. Uh, Matt, would you remind, um, did you do this and I missed it, that, uh, don't we have the first transportation, community transportation meeting uh, Thursday? Oh, yes, this Thursday. Right. Here at Town Hall is a uh, first community meeting on the transportation plan at 7, 7? 7. 7 p.m. here at Town Hall. And then our second one is February, February 7th, and that's going to be at the fire station community room. So. And we'll... Uh, Maybe send another eat blast out. What's that maybe? <laughs> <laughs> we will send one out. Lisa already assured us. Oh, okay. Thank you. Anything from the town attorney? No. Town clerk? Thank you very much. That brings us to uh, public comment on consent, consent agenda and non-agenda items. Is George doing okay? I haven't seen him for a couple of meetings. Everything's, everything's okay? Yeah, Thank cool. you. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. 
Uh, I'm Matt Finnegan at uh, 1785 South Pitkin Avenue. Um, with me is Joel Sayers. Um, 3172 Cimarron Place. <clears throat> and we're here tonight uh, representing the board of directors. We are both members at the Sister Carmen Community Center in Lafayette. And we are also residents here in Superior, obviously. Um, and we wanted to just come out and very briefly um, not ask for any money. If we were going to do that, we would certainly hold the required permit beforehand. Uh, what we did want to do was just sort of highlight briefly what's going on um, with our organization and let you know a little bit about what we're doing to help people here in the town of Superior. So I'll turn it over to Joel. Thank you. Um, uh, Sister Carmen has been around for um, 40 years, and it's the only comprehensive family resource center uh, in, in Boulder County, in East Boulder County. Um, they don't have the 2012 figures out, but for 2011, they served over 1,800 unduplicated households, um, including between 50 and 75 households here in Superior that needed help. And that's one thing um, that maybe not a lot of people in Superior know about is that um, Sister Carmen does provide a valuable resource for the, for the residents of Superior. They distribute about 1.3 million um, pounds of food per year and award over $300,000 in financial assistance to, um, to, to 470 households. And that includes stuff like mortgage assistance, short-term rent assistance, transportation assistance. And they offer a wide range of support services as well, such as parenting classes, uh, legal assistance, and help with short-term mental health issues. And um, Sister Carmen really isn't just uh, a Band-Aid or um, a, a looking to give a handout or um, a place to grab some groceries. It, its goal really is to give its participants um, self-sufficiency and self-reliance so they don't need Sister Carmen anymore. Um, and so it's a very valuable safety net for uh, Superior and East Boulder County. And Matt and I are relatively new uh, board members, but the more we meet the people there and the more we um, meet the staff and volunteers, the more we're impressed by their dedication and their empathy and their commitment. Um, so we just wanted to spread the word of the good that Sister Carmen does. And if you're so inclined, you know, shop in the thrift store or, or even maybe get involved. Um, and uh, we look forward to keeping you posted on all the good stuff they do. Great. Thanks very much. Trustee Williams? How many households did you serve for Superior in 2011? Approximately 50 to 75. Okay. I think the precise number was 53 or 50. It was It's somewhere north of 54. And did you expect um, that 2012 would be higher or lower? We would expect, based on what we have heard, that it would be higher just because the demand has just increased over the last couple of years. We've also, Sister Carmen in 2011 opened a new building um, uh, on Aspen Ridge in Lafayette, um, expanding from their what is now the thrift store on Baseline Avenue, and that increased their ability to serve um, participants. Yeah, the food bank um, greatly expanded in time. They're in, uh, in space, and so now we're serving more people than we have. I think it's been more a function of capacity than anything else, um, aside from, you know, maybe, maybe the economy is getting better, but we can handle more business. Okay. And I've toured the new facility, and it's, it's a great facility. It's great space. Um, and the way they've got it set up, it, it's very inviting for people that need, need to go and, and do business. There. Matt, are they el is Sister Carmen, by virtue of serving 53 households, are they eligible for our Town of Superior grant program? They and they are, have they are, and they and they've received year, them. They did receive them, okay. um, yep. contingency grant, as well as some additional funding. So, yeah. and, and they can still apply this year, right? Or have they? Uh, I believe so. Yep. And thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, it, it really does help, and uh, we're partial, of course, we really like the organization, um, but we'll, we'll talk to anybody who will hear us out on it, so thank you for, uh, for allowing us to talk tonight. And you also know we have a terrific Cubs, uh, Boy Scout troop, Cub Scout troop. Are they, do they go into Boy Scouts? Yeah, definitely. Um, and they're always looking for projects, so if you ever need a large number of young men to help out on food drives or, or whatnot, you may be in touch with our Cubmaster. 
Thank you. That's great yeah. to know. Yeah. And, and the chamber also does a does a food drive for Sister Carmen. Yeah. Sister Carmen's a member of the chamber and appreciate that help as well. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, Thanks for all you do. Yeah, thank you. A great thank organization. You. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, additional public comment? Seeing none, that brings to uh, seven the consent agenda. Remaining on the consent agenda is approval of the minutes of the Janu uh, January 14, 2013 Board of Trustees meeting, acceptance of the meeting notes for the Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Trails Advisory Committee, and a final approval of an ordinance amending section 16-1-70 of the Superior Municipal Code regarding definition of election seasons. With that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda by Trustee Williams, second by Trustee Gergros. And I don't think we're spending any money. So, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. That brings us to what was uh, C, which is adoption of resolution approving professional services agreement with JNT Consulting, Inc. for civil engineering, Trustee Williams. So, um, I pulled a few of these, like, they kind of all work together um, and I am pulling them in relation to the Public Works Director FTE position and um, I was curious as to at least if we talk about just 7C at this moment um, this is 60,000 more for the contract in 2013 with JT Consulting um, I'm wondering why the difference and is there any savings from year to year based on this new position? Alex, you want to come up? You know, the, for this one and the Rick Davis consulting, the, a significant portion of the funds <coughs> anticipated for this year are associated with the streets pavement and concrete project, which is to Four million this year, so. Right, it's uh, two, well, 2.4, last year was 2.1, right. so it's a little bit higher that we're doing more work this year. It's part of the reason uh, we have two specific projects, the uh, anticipating the McCaslin Boulevard Ridge intersection improvement, and then... Can the, you speak a little louder? I'm I couldn't hear that last part. The... Uh, the traffic signal at uh, the ridge, McCaslin, okay. that would be a project they would be involved in. Triple left was another project which may go away if we don't do that this year. So there's uh, three or four additional projects that we didn't have last year. So that's why the, the estimates were a little so higher than, than, than what we had spent last year. Okay, so that's why it's about 56,000 more, right. 55,000 more. Uh, because of those specific projects mm -hmm. you're talking about. Yes. Okay. If we didn't have those there. Um, right, and their, their, unit, their unit rates uh, didn't change, so we're still paying the same uh, hourly rates for their services. So um, the, the savings from having um, another FTE for the Public Works Director, not you, um, what does that get us here? And, and that one, it probably doesn't do. It's probably more on the Rick Davis side of it, and that uh, we, I haven't hired the the new position yet, so I don't know what the uh, the skill set of, of that person is going to be. And I'm I'm hoping that uh, we would have some savings there. I was providing you J and T is more design services, so I don't think it would affect that contract as much it would be the Rick Davis where we have construction observation um, and other types of, of costs that where I think would have some savings. So when you say design, is that the engineering? Yeah, the d design, you know, doing drawings and things of that nature. We don't have, yeah, bid documents and all that. But not the actual engineering or traffic engineering? Yeah, traffic engineering, we have LSC and oh, we're okay. going to have some savings there. Oh, okay. And, uh, what about just the engineering? There's a line item under engineering that says good, almost ten grand. Yeah, there may be some savings at that point. But now, that's not this contract. J and T. Yeah. Yeah, it'll it it'll is. be there. Um, I've just given you some estimates based on the projects and based on the fact that I don't have my that person hired. So it's not like I'm going to spend this money. It's just here's my my best guess based on the. 
projects we have in the budget and the staff I have at this point. I'm hoping to, to bring those down once I get that new person hired and trained and see what he can take over, what his skill set is, and whether you can take some from some of those contracts before you. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, I do. <coughs> I was going to pull these two as well, and my questions relate to both contracts, and that is our policy. These were competed in 2010, mm -hmm. so three years of four years of options. What are we talking about of options if performance is good? Uh, four years. Four years. So that would total four years or four option years. Total four. Okay. So, so these would be we would uh, either do another RFQ or or uh, RFP next year. Okay, that's what I was wondering yeah. about. For both both uh, C and D, those contracts as fall in there. Well as well, yeah, those. Yeah. Okay. Jesse Pennington. So these numbers in here, are these maxes, not to exceed amounts? These are estimates. And what typically would, would happen is for a particular project, we would get, you know, a, an estimate from them of what they think that specific project will, will cost. And, and so we'll come back and I, th I don't think last year we had a, a max on J&T. But they'll give us specific proposals for the work, and then those will be run through the, the town manager. And I'm just giving you the estimates, what I expect to spend on those, and kind of what I see as a top set amount for, for those. So I'm asking the same question. Is this the absolute well, we don't, high, or no, is it We don't it have that written estimate? into the, the contract. And, and what kind of variance do we, I mean, what's 10, our experience? 10, 20 show? percent, up or down. So. These aren't these numbers aren't going into the contracts. Right. 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 But it's it's to have them on call on an hourly basis and we have a project, we we call them and say, We want you to do this project. Mm -hmm. Give me give me a an estimate for what that's gonna be be worth with your hourly rates. We fixed the hourly rates essentially what we're doing here. Um, and then the second question was, we had a, uh, some obstacles in some of our, road, our residential road repair last year in which we discovered more severe problems than we had anticipated when they were orig originally, in my I'll use the word engineered. Mm -hmm. We expected to do a certain fix, and the fix ended up being quite a bit more s substantial. And I'm wondering if either of these parties was involved in those initial estimates and initial work, and if we have any, are we, if so, are we still confident in their ability to perform to our standards? Uh, you know, for these particular ones, I mean, we knew we were going to have problems like on the street project, and we, we provided for that. I think the issues we had were more from the contractor standpoint in terms of the scheduling, getting it done. In terms of, um, like, the biggest problem was probably on Graydon, where we had the water problem, I think, uh, mm -hmm. that we uh, uh, probably didn't know the extent of that. And I think what happened there is that we didn't, the way we had undertaken that project, we didn't do a whole lot of geotech investigations to determine the extent of the problem and um, I think that's the the issue we had there there was much more water than right. we thought there was. But was that if I, I guess I would say if I wasn't if I didn't feel confident with these firms based on last year's performance mm -hmm. I would have asked Alex to do another RFQ or MP for mm -hmm. this year. So saying hearing what Alex has to say the mm -hmm. the uh, the decision not to do more geotech in advance, that, that's our decision. That does not involve at all their well, practices. You know, in that case, we had, we had three or four different uh, ways of handling, you know, the, the water and the expanse of soils and so forth. And under drains was, was one of them. In, in this case, we needed a much right. bigger, we, we put under drains in a number of other areas uh, and without affecting the project. In Graydon, it happened that that solution was 
a really long under drain. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Gregoris? Yeah, I think what Trustee Pennington was alluding to, she didn't come out right and say it, but in reading between the lines, if we have a contractor that runs into problems the previous year, we want to make sure that either that's corrected if we're going to hire them again, mm -hmm. so we don't have a repeat in a different street mm -hmm. and more money and more expenses. So, uh, Matt, I'll have to go at your word that if you feel like these uh, contractors are going to do the right job, that we can move forward, and that if you had any hesitation, that we definitely would do an RFP. Yeah. I mean, that's... And that goes without saying, just because we have four years, that, that's not a guarantee yeah, for any contractor, and that's, we just want to make sure that everybody knows that. Okay. No. And, and that's Alex's me. word, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. So for Matt, put so. them together and, you know, yeah. we'll get Any public comment regarding this? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve Tana Superior Resolution R-6, Series 2013. A resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior approving a professional services agreement with J&T Consulting, Inc. for civil engineering services for 2013. Motion by Trustee Williams. Is there a second, Trustee Gregoris? Further discussion? Seeing none, Phyllis? Williams? Yes. Pennington? Yes. Michael? Yes. Gregoris? Yes. Sterling? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That brings us to adoption of a resolution approving professional services agreement with Rick Davis <coughs> Consulting LLC for construction inspection services for 2013. Trustee Williams. Um, so again, um, it's similar. It is similar. Um, this is a a 10 percent or a ten thousand uh, dollar reduction, um, and I'm uh, kind of going back to this public works director FTE mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that ten thousand dollars is a savings because of that position mm -hmm. it is okay um, and is this street replacement what what category is this this is street replacement it's, correct? it's several things <laughs> it's, it's it's the observation of any construction going on in town so uh, the street project is one uh, for example we Guardian Storage was one that, that uh, this firm was involved in. We're also going to have Coal Creek Crossing if that gets underway. Um, and then any uh, construction related to Excel or CenturyLink, you know, when they dig up a street, we want to put back according to our standards. So there's some observation and, and uh, uh, tracking of, of those particular projects as well. Um, so I'm going back to this um, public works director uh, detail where there's, it's kind of broken out mm -hmm. um, where the savings occurs in um, a total. And the street replacement is 20000 And I'm wondering, is that, that's part Rick Davis, but is that other 10 from somewhere else? As far as the savings? You, correct. Where would that, what would that contract be? Not with Rick Davis, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Where would the savings be? Correct. It's probably going to come from the right of way permitting and some probably reduction in what um, that uh, firm was doing with the street project, that the new position would take over some of those those duties as well. There was for, wait, say that again, for what right of way? Right of way permits. The oh, can, permits, just in general. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Rick was doing all that. We probably transitioned a new person into taking over a lot of that uh, particular area. Okay. And then he was doing a lot of uh, documentation for the street project, and we think we can get the new person okay. getting more involved in that. Okay. <laughs> That's just what I wanted to hear. And they're the ones that would be inspecting the asphalt and the concrete and all that to make sure that they're at uh, what we ordered. This is that this firm here. Yes, I mean the, the Rick Davis firm. Uh, there, the, there are eyes and ears to you know watching the contractors as they put things down that they put the right type of asphalt and they do the procedures well. They don't cover things up. Um, but then the public works director would now be overseeing. Well, that. well, yeah, and that will the, the what we're calling civil engineer is the position that would be uh, involved starting to get involved and take over some of those duties. Okay. okay. 
Anyone public comment question? regarding this? Seeing none. Um, Mr. Yep. Does anyone else have any other questions? I ask. No. So, sorry. No worries. Trustee Kirkgaard. The mayor's in charge, Deborah. I know. I'm right. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thought we missed that. I'd like to make a motion to approve Town of Superior Resolution R-7, Series 2013, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior approving a professional services agreement with Rick Davis Consulting LLC for construction inspection services for 2013. Motion by Trustee Gregoris. Is there a second? Yeah. Trustee Williams. Further discussion? Seeing none, Phyllis. Gregoris. Yes. Sorelli. Yes. Michael. Yes. Yes. Williams. Yes. Okay, that brings us to adoption of a resolution approving agreement with Superior Maintenance for maintenance and repair services for 2013. Trustee Williams. Um, so I, I Hold this again for the same reasons, um, but also in the fact that the other contracts actually had um, a cost applied to them, and this one does not. And I'm wondering um, why. That's a good question. <laughs> Is it? I, well, I guess I provided you cost estimates. We haven't had those in previous contracts. Uh, and this is one that uh, superior maintenance is on call when we have projects that we can't have them with our own staff. A good example was last week or two weeks ago where we had a water line break in sub-zero temperatures and it was got out of hand and our crews just can't, couldn't deal with that as well as what was going on. And we were able to bring, bring them and call upon their resources <coughs> to, to help us out. And then there's a number of other projects that are small little things or major that they're available to us to to supplement our staff. And, I'm, and I guess I, I yeah, should. Yeah, I mean, they provide us a, a quick resource for maybe a certain type of equipment that we don't have okay. that we need or emergency service if, if a wire line break, let's say, for instance, it's too deep, um, they, they have additional equipment that they can get to it and they're here. Um, so it's a, you know, they could be on scene within minutes if you need them. So um, it's been a good resource, good partnership for us where we don't have to go out and buy a bunch of equipment. And uh, it's available to us and additional man power if we need it is available as well. So in other words, this isn't a specific contract for a specific no. No. project. No. But to give you an estimate, it That's may be on know. the order of fifty to 100000 in that in that range just because there's a number of small projects that add up over the year. And, and this is where we would, um, I mean, we do a lot of valve repair and it would come through this contract. Mm -hmm. Does that sound right? Right. So I just wonder, thinking about that, should this also be with uh, Superior Metropolitan District number one or you don't, it doesn't make much of a difference? Um. I mean, we if, can, if we need well, to, then just put it. Yes, back, yes. Uh, that, uh, that's my only request. I don't want to do anything right now, but it, it probably needs to be with Metro One as well. Okay. Uh, Public comment. The, uh, no. Back to the procurement policy. Was was this one competitively awarded uh, as well? Yeah, it was part of that RFQ that we okay. can't do. Okay. Yeah. Good enough. Okay. Um, if there's no more board. <coughs> Comment then, Jessica Gross. <coughs> did you want to? No, no, okay. I'm coughing. Right. <laughs> I'm ready to. Jesse Williams. Um, I was going to read it, but yeah. oh. okay. You can have I'd like to approve uh, Town of Superior Resolution R 8, Series 2013. The resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior approving an hourly services agreement with Superior Maintenance. For maintenance and repair services for 2013. Motion by Trustee Gagros. Is there a second, Trustee Williams? Discussion? Seeing none. Phyllis? Pennington? <laughs> yes. Uh, Williams? Yes. Sorelli? Yes. Michael? Yes. Yes. Thank you. That brings to adoption of a resolution approving agreement with Parker Ag Services LLC for water treatment plant backwash pond solids removal for 2013 for Superior Metropolitan District Number One. And the manager had something. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Mayor. We um, asked that this item be pulled. Uh, there were a, a couple of um, insignificant, I would say, changes to Exhibit A and Exhibit B. 
that we provided to you do exhibit A and B. You want to go over those? Sure. Do you have the plan? Yep. In Exhibit A, uh, the contractor just asked for a couple of items. I I had called it, I think, uh, water plant solids, and they, uh, I thought the more precise term was residuals. Uh, they asked that the um, uh, we minimize operational disruptions to the McCasson water treatment plant when they're <coughs> doing this sludge hauling. The last bullet uh, was added. Um, this contract applies only to water treatment plant residuals that are exempt, exempt under Terra norm regulations. So these are just technical terms that the contractor added. And then last was a contractor contact person, um, and that's uh, so we have one that he that we would deal with on the on the project on Exhibit B under compensation. Uh, we added number two and three. The contractor will charge the district for the lab data collected on an annual basis, which is estimated 1400 And three, that any downtime uh, deemed to be caused by the district or the representative shall be uh, charged at the rate of $250 per hour. Just to back up, if you may have seen the big tanker trucks by the water uh, plant in the last week, and this is what they were doing. They hauled on four or five loads of these solids that come from the back backwash pond that sits there. We pump the water out, and then we remove the solids. Um, and the reason why we're doing this is that uh, in order to meet our uh, what was happening before, these solids were being dumped into the sanitary sanitary sewer system that went down to the wastewater treatment plant which caused us to exceed our, our standards for metals, mercury and silesium, I think. And it wasn't anything coming in the water. It was very diluted up in the water plant, but by the time we concentrated and it got down to the water treatment, the wastewater treatment plant, it was causing some problems because we had very low standards there. So we looked at taking these solids out and to see if we met standards, and we ended up meeting our standards by pulling these things out. The problem is we don't have a very good way of, of getting rid of them now. This is a costly operation. As you can see, we're looking at $150,000 a year to do this four, five, six times a year. So in future budgets, you'll see proposals to put sludge drying beds up at the water treatment plant and using the natural evaporation to take the these liquid solids and, you know, having the water evaporate and then coming in a much cheaper process to dis let dispose of them. So that will be coming down. This is a costly process that we're doing now. Now we hope to to come back with a, a less costly process in the future. And there's no way for us to use our centrifuge at the wastewater treatment plant to do, to uh, remove some of the water so it's not so, has so much volume? And, well, we do, but we're still they're still the metals are still making it down there when they were being dumped into the sanitary sewer mm. and still causing us to exceed the standards and so the state was aware of this and they um, they know what we're doing and uh, they gave us um, they want us to take take care of this problem okay. so does that um, does that change the outcome at the wastewater treatment plant um, for the basic outcome is the cake that's um, compost mm -hmm. that comes out of those pipes, comes mm -hmm. into the... That gets dumped into the... Trenches or whatever you want to call it. Into the trailers and then... Right. Gets Does that change that component? No. It, no, no. So we, still have, we still have solids down at the wastewater treatment okay. plant. Yeah. So it, it doesn't change the volume. No. Of that. No, it just helps us meet our. There, there's a little bit, because we're hauling off solids, so there's a little bit less that, it we, is have a to little less. that we have to haul off down there. Yeah. So that doesn't translate uh, financially in Not the way, shape, or form. Yeah. And does Parker Ag need a special permit to dispose of, the, of these metals? It, it ends up getting mixed with other sludges, I guess, and ends up being composted. 
somehow, I said, that, that's my understanding, is that they take it out and they end up, you know, combining it with other other slugs or other... But we're comfortable that they have all the... Well, that's, I think that's what some of these things, the lab testing and all that, is getting to that to make sure they can take this stuff and dispose of it, uh, you know, according to whatever regulations mm -hmm. they need to. Okay. So uh, more questions? Just, Justice Riley. The um, third paragraph in the compensation, the new downtime change, is there some history there that's led to this change? This request by the contractor for that paragraph to be added? Uh, I believe there were some issues that had occurred with, you know, before we were renting some of the equipment, now it's built into their rates, so, but if there's anything that comes up, I guess I'm not all familiar with all the operations, but we have to be prepared for them to come. You know, when they come and show up, we have to be prepared that they're ready to roll. I guess my question was there bad history here? Did we have them wasting their time? Or? Um, well, for example, they, this past uh, hauling that they were doing occurred because we had some issues with icing in the pond, and the ice was backing up, and so we needed them out right away. And so that caused some issues there that they had to come out much earlier and much more unexpectedly. Much more unexpectedly than they they figured. So there were there's some the bad history, but I think it's just we just got into this in, in July and we're, we're kind of ironing out the issues of how this is all going to work. Okay. Some board questions. Not. Uh, I don't entertain a motion. Anybody? I'd like to make a motion for Superior Metropolitan District Number One Resolution Number SMD One Two Series 2013, a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Superior Metropolitan District Number One, approving a general services agreement with Parker Ag Services LLC for water treatment plant backwash pond cleaning services for 2013. Motion by Trustee Williams. Is there a second? Mr. Gross, any further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, Phyllis. Uh, Williams? Yes. Pennington? Yes. Buckle? Yes. Yes. Really? Yes. Thank you. That brings us to eight. Adoption of a resolution approving a memo of understanding for the Regional Transportation District Northwest Area Mobility Study. Trustee Williams? So, um, I wanted to find out um, how are we participating specifically, um, what are their regular meetings, and who's our elected representative, and who is our staff rep representative? So I'm the elected representative because it's running through uh, US 36 mayors and commissioners, and Beth Moiske is the staff representative. And it's not running through Metro Mayor's Caucus? Not Metro Mayor's, US 36 it's, mayors and commissioners. It is, okay. I mean, RTD is doing the study, but for the uh, stakeholders, I guess, if Okay. You will. And so when are the meetings? How often are they? <coughs> what are your duties? There's uh, so the, the request for a proposal for the contract is still out with RTD, so that they'll be setting up the these meetings as well as public meetings. So when do you anticipate them? Are they monthly? No, I don't quarter? know. You know, so they'll not? probably, you know, they'll have to do some background information. So my guess is that <coughs> that'll take them, you know, whoever the elected, uh, whoever RTD goes with is probably going to take a few months to get up to speed. Mm -hmm. um, and then my guess is that US 36 may, mayors meets once or twice a month. And so there'll probably it would be an update at all of those meetings. Okay, so they'll report to those meetings. Mm -hmm. they, they won't have meetings outside of those. Uh, there will be public uh, public and open houses as well. Okay. Um, so just keep us mm -hmm. apprised of it um, as well as Beth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to make sure we're well represented, which sounds like we are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Deb, just, can I interject yeah, something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the concern here is uh, I've attended I attend Dr. Cog and occasionally 36 Commuting Solutions. When the issue of Northwest Area 
mobility study is brought up, and it's always in the context of those towns who think they should have gotten rail. They, they seem to expect um, particular emphasis here. And uh, my, um, my concern is whatever happens in contiguous communities ultimately affects us. If, in fact, uh, they get great rail service and our BRT here doesn't keep pace, uh, when we're trying to populate the town center, trying to keep traffic coming to Superior Marketplace, it's all threatened. I mean, we are, they are competitors. And uh, so I think you probably already do this, Mayor, but I would really strongly encourage us to be really um, uh, participatory in these things and strongly represent Superior because uh, I think clearly the Longmonts and the Boulders and Louisville who uh, feel wronged by uh, the delay till 2042 in train service are going to be front and center and I'd like to see us front and center to protecting our own turf. Mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see, you know, I think uh, I went over it pretty fast, but the, it'd be interesting to see what the segmenting studies look like when they talk about rail, you know, because it, they probably won't have enough cash flow to go from, you know, where it ends and pay goes, or I forget where it ends right now, all the way to Boulder. Um, so, but they say that they'll have realistic uh, anticipation of what those costs would be and what the timeline would look like. So, when I know Mar, for sure we'll let you know. And I think that um, our town center is going to be very, it's going to be very crucial that we rely on a, a very well-developed either BRT or some kind of rail or light rail that is nearby that we can uh, utilize because if the town center is easily accessible to um, alternative transportation, it will be much more successful than if it wasn't. So I, that's... Um, so I totally... Uh, I, 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 um understand and agree with the concept that um, the whole area needs to be good mobility in a sort of a backward way since we don't have rail and what the outcome of the study is like going to be likely to be which is increased BRT in a way that's actually going to be a benefit to us yeah. can see that. especially if we have a direct service either well either from here to the airport or from here to downtown Denver, mm -hmm. preferably both, yep. or from here to Boulder. And that would be, that's the, I keep pushing on that one. So they, they agree that they, that was part of the uh, commitment that they made to us in, as part of phase two of the, um, the construction project. So we'll see if they actually come out with that. But. Uh, any other questions or comments? <laughs> Otherwise, a motion, Trustee Gergers. Uh, would like to make a motion to approve Town of Superior Resolution Number R-9, Sears 2013, a resolution of the Board of Trustees of the Town of Superior authorizing the Mayor to sign a memorandum of understanding between the Regional Transportation District, RTD, and stakeholders regarding the Northwest Area Mobility Study. Motion by Trustee Gergers. Is there a second? Trustee Williams, for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor, unanimous, thank you. That brings us to adoption of, a of the Planning Commission, Historical Commission, Open Space Advisory Committee, Parks Recreation, Open Space Advisory Committee, and the Recycling and Conservation Advisory Committee 2013 work plans. Trustee Williams. So, a um, couple. And, and Mayor, just so you're missing out Trustee Cirelli, who just raises his hand <laughs> over a lot of the time, so, so you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, okay. I just wants to, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> throw, throw something at me if I. Yeah. Okay. Oh, fine. Yep. All right. Look that way more often. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's only one of us down here. That's why I said, There's you know, I could be, you, the first meeting you will remember that I said I maybe I should sit on one side so I could see everybody. So. He wanted my spot. I wouldn't give it up. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a, a, a um, specific little 
nuance in every single, almost every single work plan that I'd like to discuss uh, and possibly talk about eliminating. Um, sorry, but I'm looking for the specific here. Um, let's go to Town of Superior Pro Stack 2013 work plan. Um, and that's just, we'll just start so there. I, but um, I, I'm just it's doing in the order in my packet. So is historical commission, do you have, are you going to talk about that as well? And, and actually, I let me just say it this way. Uh -huh. um, the, the connection um, of a Rocky Flats trail system is the one component that I'm not so sure that we should be promoting in all of our work plans. And it seems um, OSAC, ProStack, and I even think... Um, RCAC uh, have in every one of their plans something of uh, capable of connecting with an eventual Rocky Flats trail system. Another one says remember to add Rocky Flats trail links. Um, another one, but you get my drift. Right. You get my drift. So what I, I would like to see is. Um, Let's talk about that. Do we think that we're kind of um, jumping the gun on that um, as far as putting that in our work plans? So from my perspective, I, I think that it's uh, a valuable um, project to proceed with. It's actually one of the ways that we would connect with the um, plan to go to uh, the, like the arsenal. Uh, through the, I can't remember what the other, there's one other wildlife refuge area. Um, Rocky Mountain National Park? Uh, no, no, that's no, going the other way. way. Two, two ponds or three ponds? Outside. I forget. <laughs> Something ponds or whatever. So that would make it a, I think it's actually a, a statewide, uh, very valuable um, connection. Um, so personally, I think that our residents would benefit from having that connection, but. And the way I read those, or the way I thought about them when I, when I read them was more so getting a trail connection to our southern border. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean. Um, and I'm not saying. No, I understand. Uh, what I'm saying here is we're promoting at this point based on how these are worded that um, we're promoting trails to Rocky Flats specifically. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's something that we should be putting in a work plan right now. And I honestly, I have, to, I have to agree with that, but that's the one thing that I wouldn't want to be here. I mean, everything else seems okay to me, but I... If, if it helps people, the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't have any money to do any of this anyway, so it's not coming anytime soon. So. But it's not so much about it's about how we, we represent ourselves, and I think for the time being, I would I would like to put a just draw a, a, a red line across a line that in and, the sand? And, and eliminate that. A line in the plutonium dust. Well, I, I'm just <laughs> pardon me. It, 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 it comes the up the trails, times. the trails will be there. I agree. So, okay. no matter whether or not we make a connection to them or not, but the trails will be there. So. No, I understand that. I just want the way that it's written here. If if, if we want to approve this, I wouldn't approve of the way it is written yeah. right no. now unless we cross that off. Trails good. Yep. But saying specifically to Rocky Flats at this juncture, I would, I would say I'd rather not have that those wording that yeah. particular I, wording. Yeah, I totally there. agree. Okay. And I'm actually very happy you brought this up because. Steam comes out of my ears when I read this. And uh, um, so I am perfectly supportive of clearer language that says uh, uh, trails to superior southern border, Yeah. if that's the intent. But to uh, put forth the specific wording of anything to do with connecting to Rocky Flats trails to me is counter uh, to our other pursuits at the at the moment, and frankly, to my long-term beliefs, and uh, I'd like to see that language, that specific Rocky Flats language, dropped. Okay. And do we have to vote on this? Personally, I think, more, uh, yeah, we should approve the work plans. So, 
And uh, the only two were ProStack and OSAC was the only two reference that I saw. Um, I don't even see it in ProStack. I'm it's over right here, it, obviously. It's right here. And it's on page 103. Oh, okay. It's it's in three. Um, where? It's page 103 for ProStack, and it's... Uh, okay, so it's OSAC in their second quarter. Mm -hmm. That's um, the ongoing, too. It's the ongoing. It's uh, the ongoing as well. Thank you. I highlighted that. I missed it. Uh, it's on the ongoing for ProStack. Mm -hmm. And what's the third one, though? So just so I long as that we was. just so long as that we don't have to wordsmith this in tonight. I'm uh, not word. Yeah. The town staff just will to remove this the, the, wherever it's referenced. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. So, so just say so it that way. Not to. Uh, we don't need to do anything to this tonight either, but I seem to remember that these references might be in our trails master plan uh, as well. Uh, so I don't think so, but not I'll sure about that. <laughs> I, let me. This is not new. This has been in for probably. We're probably more sensitive to it now. We are more, more sensitive. We are. I, it didn't even dawn on me when I read this. Would you, yeah. Right. I mean, this has been in. We've been talking about this for a while. So, so as long as we can eliminate that, I'm okay moving forward with the passing the resolution. But just want to make any reference to Rocky Flats. I have a, a <laughs> minor. Trustee, <laughs> Trustee Williams, did oh. you have? I have one anything else? Thing. Yeah, and yeah. then Trustee Pennington. Uh, and then there was one other thing that um, RCAC. RCAC um, there is something that says uh, ongoing evaluate recycling program universally, and I, I think that's vague in the fact that well I think what that means is that they're going to analyze the usage and validity and participation and cost of each program that RCAC has, which they have a number of programs that was passed in the budget that's somewhere around $95,000 that is geared towards RCAC uh, program. <laughs> and if that is not what I think that is, what that ongoing bullet says, then I don't see that in the RCAC um, work plan. Right, and it can be otherwise interpreted as uh, evaluating the Town of Superior's recycling program because we had uh, them up one time saying how we fell low and that was corrected by I think some an HOA official right etc so in the the intent of that bullet point needs to be clarified well, what would you recommend how do we I'm not wordsmithing it um, I'm I mean, here pointing out yeah. that it, I, I, I don't know what this is with Deborah that we did have a commitment that that nine, the efficacy of that ninety-five thousand dollar, but those budget items would be assessed and it would be <coughs> reported back to us well, in a measurable way. Um, yes, because some programs are effective and some are not, and maybe they're all. I don't know, but I'd like. To, I'd like this to is know so that. vague; it just covers everything. I mean, it's. So I Too would, vague. And I'm just yeah. not seeing, that was to me, I was really looking forward to seeing that on the work plan and it wasn't there. Can I make a proposal? Or if Please it is do. there. That we actually, uh, I mean, these are their work plans for us to review and if we don't like something, we take it off and if we wish something were on there, we put it on. And so I think we actually, uh, you know, I <coughs> think we can eliminate this bullet because I don't personally think we've got to evaluate the uh, current recycling program. I feel uh, confident that it is effective, et cetera, et cetera. If you disagree with me, we can keep that bullet point, but I do think there has to be a bullet point that says evaluate the um, cost effectiveness of and participation. Well, cost effectiveness is participation. Okay, cost effectiveness Sports of living. all current um, RCAC uh, programs that involve a, a expenditure. So I would add that and eliminate the evaluate recycling program universally. I would eliminate I don't, that. You know, I think that the, I, I don't know what we. We don't know what I they think, meant by that. Leave it in. And I, I'd leave it in because okay. it I'm fine with it. We don't know what that is. They can, they can eliminate it themselves yeah. if, in Correct. fact, right. 
they never intended it to yeah. be that. I mean, we'll see it in there. I don't know. We'll see it in their notes and stuff. I can leave it in. Uh, evaluate the recycling yeah. program just in general is always a good, yep. a good practice. So I, I'm not, I don't take issue to that. I'm just wondering where. But is this where the $95,000 is going to be spent on? No, uh, no, 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 no. No, this is free. That's okay, in that free? other bullet no. point. Yeah. Right. As every committee is. Okay. Okay. I see Pennington. On, um, third quarter dog park pilot program, I'm assuming that's the dog park thing where we put organic down. Park -cat. So it's Cardiac third park quarter, park quarter park number three. Composting, is that right? Composting poop. It's composting. I'm not making it up. <laughs> you do make up stuff from time to time. <laughs> is that what that is? Is that really true? Yes, it's true. Jim Payne, 2475 <laughs> Clean Circle, uh, Chair of ProStack. Now that's actually the, it's actually a program uh, where they actually compose the dog poop, and it's it's similar, if you will, to some of the programs we've had where we've had work with third parties who take the uh, oil and so forth and re rework right. it, and they do that with the dog poop. Who it's, does that? It's a company. It's called. It's got a. Uh, the name escapes me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a name. a pro stack meeting? You, I believe they have, and they've okay. cut, they, they do it with other towns and municipalities in the area. Because I seem so to remember a presentation. And that's their job. This is what they do yes. for a living. Exactly. So could we just have a clarified dog park, uh, dog waste <laughs> composting program? <laughs> so we know what, okay. what okay. this is. We can reword it. Okay. And if I may comment on the trail uh, to 128, it just you're, you are right. I mean, the sense of what you're saying is correct, that with both OSAC, because I was on OSAC at the time, and ProStack, um, the intention was to connect from Colton to 128. The alignment with a possible uh, Rocky Flats trail system was sort of an afterthought and a nice thing to do if it ever happens. So we can take that out. I did just look at the trail plan the five-year trail plan, and the five-year trail plan says, in an out year, a connection <coughs> from Colton Trailhead to 128. Makes no reference to Rocky Flats. So we can use, use that same I've language. I've never seen that wording before. So, use um, that same language in the two work plans. Um, that would, I think, be, that would be great. Jim, before you leave, on uh, maybe you can add clarity to the second quarter, number three, two. I didn't know we. Maybe I'm just in the dark. Provide yard waste organics hauling service. Is that a new initiative? Which one are we on? Uh, our second quarter, second quarter, second quarter number again, three. Provide number three. yard waste organics hauling right. service. Is that a proposal for a new thing? Uh, I wouldn't know. But he's not an architect. But I believe he attends the meetings. <laughs> sometimes, yeah. I, I, they, they, they have talked. They, they have talked about in meetings I've been in about um, trying to add yard waste removal, as a component. curbside removal. Yeah. Mm, um, that would be good. Well, my um, uh, my frustration here is, it, wouldn't the appropriate language be if it, it's not a current program to investigate the feasibility of offering a yard waste organics? hauling service. I fear that by approving something that has that word provide, they can come back to us and say, well, we put it in there and you approved it, so you thereby authorized that we could start this program. Have no charge, though. They don't start anything. I mean, yeah. we do. Well, I just want to be clear the here. Town does it. You're right. I mean, the, but it doesn't the, come through the board as a... The HOA, program. which provides... You're right about that. No, it would come exactly to it, most of the If town. it's free, it would... If it's, the board. Over 25, if it's over 25, if it's over 25, it comes to us, but it could this be is staff. No charge, though. Is it no charge. charge. This is no and charge. And the HOA provides yard waste. It's optional. It's optional. Anybody can sign up for that. You pay for that. It's $100 a year, and it, I think they're, it's seasonal, so they're like 10 pickups from uh -huh. all but the winter months. If, if it's free, I'm all for it. Okay. Well, that's what it states here, so. Well, it wouldn't be done free. It's not going to happen. <laughs> it wouldn't be done for free. <laughs> the compost is at no charge. Yeah. We're interpreting the program. Yeah. Somebody's going to charge yeah. them all that stuff. Yeah. 
So I would, That's true. I, I say we should amend it to say investigate the feasibility of. Yeah, unless we, I don't think we've been doing anything like that yeah. except uh, yeah. large, what is it, cleanup day thing is the closest thing. So this needs to be investigated, I guess, as the feasibility uh, of this program. Okay, so I think Chelsea Pennington's language, is everybody comfortable with that? Yep. Mm -hmm. So, and then, Tim, can I ask you a question also, just in terms of the, what What do you see, um, I can't find the language now, but it has to do with the uh, school site. What does yes. that What does that process look well, like to you? Well, there's two engagement processes that the board is um, um, given us to go ahead for, and I guess are budgeted for this year. And um, one of them is the school parcel. Mm -hmm. So we're now looking at the scheduling for that and exactly what the details of that will be. Um, and I believe that one calls for complete, we haven't quite worked that out, but that one calls for um, completion in time to, for you to have, the board to have our input before the budget cycle. But it would be sometime over the summer. Okay. Um, I, I just want to caution, I mean, however this works, great. I'm just cautioning pros <coughs> that sometimes when uh, a visioning or whatever that outreach process would look like, then the next thing is that, well, 2014, we're going to build the park. Yeah. You know what I mean? So just whenever you run those or whoever's going to run those, just be cautious that this does not mean that next year X is going to happen. I mean, we, from our vantage point, are are pursuing both that and the possibility of a rec center, or community center of some kind, right. as needs analysis. I mean, we're not trying to get ahead of ourselves or ahead of you, certainly. Um, we want to sort of gauge yeah. what the community f feels is the need. Yeah. And I think, okay. although from our past processes, we're very careful about not. Yes. But it's a good point. It's just, you know, because potentially that's a really big, really expensive right. project. So, okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Right, thank you. So just, um, Matt, uh, on the third quarter on RCAC, that same yard waste organics is mentioned in number two, so that would have to, okay, okay. great, you caught it. Yeah. Great. And so the dog park pilot program, the explore fall leaf collection, are these programs that they're going to implement the third quarter or are they going to assess those and uh, determine whether it's a program that we would like to have? Correct. That last statement is correct. The last statement. Can we incorporate that statement in there? If, if you would like, yeah. It would because be at the end of the day, there's, you know, we're, so well, however the board feels comfortable. But if a contract has to be signed with somebody to do something, to know the board it. will see it. Because right. the board will have to take action on it. Unless it's under a certain amount. Well, yeah, the manager uh, can't I, sign I, I, Not in this case, not with no. this budget, because last year I um, made a statement to the board that any funds spent out of that fund would come back to the board. Out of what fund? The RCAC. The, the RCAC. waste diversion line in the budget. Yeah. Okay. So it would, it would, in the, yeah, and you'll start to see those coming up yeah. in February. That's <laughs> good. Um, already, so. Transparency. So, yeah. Even if it's under $25,000, you are still going to see it. That's good. Okay. So I would bring that forward to you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Yeah, because I, I, mean, I really would like to know what programs um, work. work really well and, and, and really beat and those up. Actually, RCAC has been started discussing amongst themselves and I'm meeting with them next month. They feel like some of the programs that are in that line item don't aren't appropriate for that line. They should be in a different line item. They uh, rightfully have raised the point some of this should be in the general fund. Right. Right. So I think so, that is good consideration. And, and what those, ones are we talking that should be in like the, the spring cleanup and yeah. Because that's not a recycling program, or because why? Um, it's not something they oversee, really. I mean, it's something that's that uh, Because it's so established that it's But it's, it's an become, event that they handle, right? Well, but no, it can no, also be in the budget. It. Oh, okay. It's, it's okay. not in their stewardship. Okay. So, yeah. That's right. So, that's. We started discussing with that. 
and water audits might be in right. the metropolitan That's district. Completely staff administered. Mm -hmm. And they have nothing to do with it. Okay. Okay. So with those changes, is there a motion? I have one more. <laughs> and it, it, this uh, under historical commission, which is the very first one, page 100, <coughs> go down to uh, second quarter number seven uh, regarding the coloring book. I would propose just putting a period after a book. Um, this exploring opportunities to collect sponsorship revenue has been mixed at staff's request, and uh, so, and they discussed that at the last meeting, and they're just great with that. And there was yeah, the cost uh, to print them was a thousand dollars. Right, so, right. Um, okay. Uh, rather than deal with ad right. advertising. Mm -hmm. like that, so. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That's the coloring book. Mm -hmm. yes. oh, okay. Period after the word book on coloring book and the rest goes. Okay. Now, is there a motion here? I mean, what, and what is the yeah, just a motion to approve the work plan. And approve the five advisory with these changes. Uh -huh. Commission work plan for 2013. So that's a motion by Trustee Gagaris. Is there a second? Trustee Pennington. Further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. That brings the eight preliminary reading of an ordinance amending uh, sections 10 50 and 10 8 60 of the Superior Municipal Code regarding possession of marijuana and drug paraphernalia in light of Amendment 64. Mr. Magley? Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'm going to have uh, Town Attorney Peter Carberry uh, provide an overview for the board on these sure. two items. This is the first ordinance here is an ordinance to bring our code up to compliance with Amendment 64. So Amendment 64 does allow possession of marijuana under limited circumstances by persons of 21 and older. Um, so this will allow that possession. Um, the other thing it will do is update the town's paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia ordinance to specifically allow for marijuana properly used for marijuana but while still maintaining the prohibition on paraphernalia for other drugs. So that's the first thing it does. The other thing it does as well is talk about open and public. What Amendment 64 allows is consumption of marijuana that is not that does not occur quote openly or publicly. Amendment 64 did not define openly or publicly. So this ordinance defines openly or publicly. <clears throat> Specifically, there are two ways in which openly or publicly are relevant to Amendment 64. You cannot consume marijuana openly or publicly, of what, no matter what age you are, and you no, cannot grow marijuana openly or publicly. As you may recall, Amendment 64 allows Like Purple Park, that wouldn't be a good place to right, yeah. <laughs> Or your doorstep. Yeah. So, as you may recall, Amendment 64 allows each person to grow up to six plants uh, for their own use, uh, three flowering, three non-flowering at any time. Um, one of the things the town may want to consider later, we haven't gotten there yet, but is some building regulations to address these. Some cities are, and towns are adopting regulations regarding lighting, more building code type regulations, what lights can be used, what ventilation systems are needed, that kind of thing. That's just starting to play out among most municipalities. I don't know that, I think Greenwood Village has adopted some pretty comprehensive regulations about lighting and things like that, but most communities have not gotten there yet. For growth centers, uh, for a commercial use, or no, this would just in your house. In your house, hmm. yes. So, okay. because right now under Amendment 64, you can grow in your house up to six plants, three flowering, and even six plants, from what I understand, takes a lot of modifications, um, hmm. specific lights, heating, ventilation, those kinds of things. So, I think what these building regulations will focus on are any anything that could be dangerous related to those lights or ventilation systems or the failure to have the ventilation which is apparently even more of a problem because it can cause substantial mold oh really because mm -hmm. the amount of water that they need but it's a good mold so <laughs> the good kind yes so that's coming that's not in this ordinance i just want to throw that out there so this or this ordinance does define openly or publicly in the one area that it goes beyond a typical definition of openly or publicly. Most of the definition is taken from the liquor code. It's already a, a try, tested in a tested definition for openly or publicly. What this does include, what I want to point out, is openly or publicly includes the consumption or growing of marijuana in any place not used for residential purposes 
where individuals gather to consume or grow marijuana, regardless of whether a such place calls itself private or public or charges an admission or membership fee. This is intended to address the marijuana club that I, you may have read uh, about. They had one in Lafayette. There was one in Southern Colorado that only opened, was only open <coughs> today. But that's what this language is intended to cover. You'll see in the next ordinance, we also cover it there. So we're double, we're doing it twice. Bennington. Um, in reading the actual wording of this code, particularly that clause you just read, I get immensely frustrated because it's not written explicitly to describe what is private, but instead what is public. Yes. And um, so the, doesn't the law say it must be consumed in private? No. So no. It, what does it say? It says it may not be consumed in public. It omits. Using um, the terms of the, okay. the law. <laughs> the, um, That's why we did it this way. I agree. Yeah, it is. I'm having to go, do they mean this? Do they mean that? Do they mean the other? And if, if I'm confused and I'm a little knowledgeable, I think, geez, the, this is going to be very frustrating. That um, paragraph that you just referenced, tell me where it is because I oh, um, sorry. It's on page 111. Page two, yeah. the definition of openly or publicly. So okay. So I'm going to, so I, it's our page 111, that first uh, bold face part of a paragraph there. And I'm going to the part Kendra reference, which is four, five lines from the bottom. Start, it's, it says, marijuana in any place not used for residential purposes where individuals gather to consume or grow where marijuana. Are you? Page, Page 111, 11. that insert indented paragraph at the top, <coughs> five lines from the top, starting with the word marijuana. The concern I have here, Kendra, if let's do the scenario where we have a private club on the bottom and we have our residential lofts on the top, mm -hmm. because that's the new model we're trying to go to, right? Sure. Um, so we have a private marijuana club on the bottom. So when you read this, it says, in any place not used for residential purposes. Is this clear enough that in those instances there would be no confusion, in your opinion? Yes. Why? Well, it, it, cause, because it will depend on how that building is zoned. For example, if you have mixed-use zoning so, and that you specifically allow residential to only be used in the top, and the bottom is zoned for non-residential use, the marijuana club would be allowed downstairs. Would be. Would be. Ooh. Ooh. Isn't that what we're trying to cover here? Well, I, and, and if it is, we can certainly change that. <laughs> no, we don't want that marijuana, private marijuana club below that residential. I don't sense. Right. You are, cor you are correct. That, and then we can certainly expand on this or change it to include that situation. Well, any sort of mixed-use situation where there would be residential over commercial. Right. We can certainly expand it to include that. Let's do that. Okay. I think that's... <coughs> so, okay. This has to come back for... Yes, it's yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. So we're just... Yep. Uh, right. Good Ready. catch. Ready. And yes, Sandy. then another little one on C, since this is the actual code, fourth line down, starting with flowering plants, period, a person just changed that to may possess rather than Sorry, mark. C. C, just fourth right line, oh, down, oh, starting, okay. Thank okay. You. I actually read this. <laughs> may possess instead of my possess. Yes. I think that's it. Public comment, seeing none. Really? Well, no, there's, this is just a preliminary. Yep. So a motion to approve the preliminary. Trustee Edgar Gross. With those changes? Yes. Am I reading something? Uh, no. No. This is oh. making a motion. So, yes. yes. Is there a second? Yeah. Okay. Trustee Williams, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. That brings to eight, which I we've Nine. touched upon. Nine. Nine, sorry. Nine. And Kendra, anything else to add here? Uh, let me just. What was the purpose this. of this one, Kendra? This is a ban on the this retail. Is so this is right. Retail. So this is, again, what some communities are doing are temporary bans. This is a permanent ban. Of course, knowing that at any time, if you change your mind, we could come back and remove this ban. Ban, excuse me. So this is a ban of retail marijuana centers, so marijuana stores, and it also includes a ban of marijuana clubs. 
we don't have any permitted use right now for a marijuana club, so it would be very difficult for anyone to put one in town. We don't, it's not a permitted use under our land use code, but this goes the extra step of saying we are banning retail marijuana establishments and marijuana clubs as well. Let me ask you this. Uh, if we had the town center right now, would that be a permitted use there? No. No. It's not listed as permitted. In, as I said, in some cases, as I think we discussed at some point, in some communities they have permitted uses called fraternal clubs, fraternal organizations, those kinds of things. These clubs are trying to fit themselves in to that definition as a permitted use. Superior doesn't have that as a permitted use in any zone district. So we're not as vulnerable as some other communities, but we thought this would make it clear that there's a ban on marijuana clubs as well as retail establishments. And the build out of 76 street properties, uh, would that be a permitted use? There it's is no, no area okay. where it's permitted use right now. Right, so and 76th Street is um, not in, strong. No, it's not, office. In, it's not in the <laughs> superior. So if we annex them, we could tell them what we want. Okay. Thank you. So I have a, a Go ahead. edit under the fourth whereas second line that it is in the best interest of the public health. You're remarkable. I'm an editor, <laughs> so I'm a little nitpicky. Okay, I think we can. Okay. Anything else? Public comment? Seeing none. Jessica Gross. We can make a motion on this one. Right. Same thing. It's a preliminary. It's a preliminary. Yeah. Just on this one. Motion. Just, uh, okay. Preliminary. Um, All right. Motion by Trustee Gregory, second by Trustee Williams. Further discussion, all in favor? Unanimous. And, and this will come back in two weeks? Yes. Okay. Okay. <coughs> all right, that brings us to item number 10, executive session to determine positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, develop a strategy for negotiations and or instruct negotiators pursuant to CRS.